Okay, as far as I see, almost all of the panelists and moderators are present here. I hope you all hear me clearly. <clears throat> distinguished Rector of the Ankara University, Distinguished President of the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, Distinguished Head of the Academic Institutions Program at WIPO Academy, Distinguished Faculty uh, Program Coordinators, Lecturers, Panelists, uh, alumni, students and participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to the IP conference, uh, Standard Essential Patents and the Internet of Things. As uh, some of you may already be aware of, three partners, that is to say Ankara University, the Turk Patent and uh, WIPO have been offering a joint master's program in intellectual property since uh, 2016. Uh, on the occasion of the closing of master's program in each year, uh, the three partners have been organizing an IP conference. And the theme of this year is Standard Essential Patents and the Internet of Things. Uh, normally, this closing conference is, is held in a physical environment in Ankara uh, with the presence of uh, our students, partners, and faculty. Uh, nevertheless, due to the situation surrounding the pandemic, as all of you are aware of uh, the conference of this year is being held virtually today. Uh, we feel the absence of lively discussions and the presence of our students in the physical environment. Uh, nevertheless, the virtual environment has certain advantages as well. We have our panelists, moderators and speakers today joining in the conference from a number of different places. Uh, summing up uh, today's program briefly, the first presentation is going to be delivered by Professor Dr. Heinz Godard at partner, a partner at Böhmert und Böhmert uh, in Munich, which is going to be moderated by Professor Dr. Uh, Arzu Oz, the director of the IP Research Center of Ankara University. Then we are going to move on with the presentation of Dr. Uh, Onur Shahin from Interdigital uh, in London, which will be moderated by Mr. Jamil, Jamil Bashpanar, the Vice President of uh, Turk Patent. Last but not least, uh, Ms. Tomoko Miyamoto, the Head of the Patent and Treaties Law Section at WIPO in Geneva, is going to give her presentation, which will be moderated by uh, Ms. Marta Chikoware uh, from WIPO Academy. But before moving on, <clears throat> with these uh, presentations, we are going to proceed with the opening remarks by three partners of this master's program. Uh, so without any delay, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Nejet Unuar, Director of Ankara University, to, to deliver the first opening speech. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Türk Patent ve Marka Kurumu'nun çok değerli başkanı. WIPO Akademi Akademik Programlar Birimi'nin çok değerli başkanı, değerli hocalarım, saygıdeğer panelistler, çok kıymetli öğrenciler ve sayın katılımcılar, Dünya Fikri Mülkiyet Teşkilatı ve Türk Patent ve Marka Kurumu ile birlikte Ankara Sesi FISOM Koordinatörlüğünde yürüttüğümüz Fikri Mülkiyet Hukuku İngilizce Yüksek Lisans Programı 2020-2021 Eğitim Öğretim Yılı Kapanış Konferansı'na hoş geldiniz diyerek sözlerime başlamak istiyorum. Distinguished President of the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, Distinguished Head of the Academic Institutions Program at WIPO Academy, Distinguished Professors, Lecturers, Panelists, Students and Participants, I'd like to welcome you to the closing conference of the 2020-2021 Academic Year of the Master of Laws and Intellectual Property Program, jointly organized by Ankara University 
World Intellectual Property Organization and the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office. Dönemin başında en azından Mayıs ayında öğrencilerimizle bir araya gelmeyi ümitin, ümit etmiş olsak da gerçekleştirmek maalesef pandemi sebebiyle mümkün olmadı. Tüm öğrencilerimize ama özellikle yabancı öğrencilerimizi ikinci evlerinde Ankara Üniversitesi'nde ağırlayamamanın üzüntüsünü duyuyoruz. Bu her ne kadar bir son gibi gözükse de aslında bir başlangıç. Sizler artık Ankara Üniversitesi ailesinin kıymetli mensuplarsınız. En kısa zamanda sizleri ikinci evinizde ağırlamak, yüz yüze bir araya gelmeyi arz ediyorum. Bilin ki bundan sonra iletişim içinde olmaya devam edeceğiz. Her daim yanınızda olacağız, başarılarınızda gurur duyacağız. Although we had planned to welcome our students in the premises of Ankara University for at least a month in May, it was not possible due to the pandemic. I'd like to express my regret for not having the opportunity to host our students and especially our international students at their second home, Ankara University. Even though it seems like an end, this is a new beginning. You have become full members of the Ankara University community. And I look forward to hosting you and meeting you in person at the first opportunity. We will definitely keep in touch and we are going to support you in all aspects and take pride in your future success. Yaşanan zorluklar insanları yeni çözüm yollarına iter. Pandemi de bizi uzaktan eğitim araçlarına yöneltti. Belki de pandemi olmasaydı hepimizin bir araya gelmesi mümkün olmayabilecekti. Ben dün gece saat 2'de e, yurda döndüm ve bugün karşınızdayız. Uzaktan eğitimin bize sağladığı imkanlarla e, bir aradayız. Ankara Üniversitesi kullanmış olduğu altyapısı e, bulunduğu için geçen bahar döneminde bir hafta içinde uzaktan eğitime e, geçiş yaptı. Edindiğimiz tecrübeyi de bu yıl bahar yarı yılına aktarabildik. Her ne kadar yüz yüze bir eğitim söz konusu olmasa da uzaktan eğitimin kendine özgü avantajlarını da kullanarak olabilen en iyi koşullarda bahar yarı yılını tamamlamış bulunuyoruz. Challenges encourage people to find new solutions. Global pandemic has encouraged us to utilize distance learning facilities. And maybe if there wasn't pandemic, I wouldn't be here with you today. I wouldn't have had the opportunity because I was abroad and I returned to Turkey at two o'clock last night. Thanks to our already established distance learning facilities, it took us only one week to adapt to distance learning in the entire university during the outbreak of pandemic. Taking advantage of this already established infrastructure, we have passed on our experience to this year. Despite lack of human interaction, we completed this academic year in the best possible way, benefiting from the advantages of virtual classes. Sevgili mezunlarımız, her üç partnerin katkısı ve kıymeti hocalarımızla dünyanın sayılı programlarından birini başarıyla tamamlamak üzeresiniz. Bundan sonra ulusal ve uluslararası politikalar sizler yön vereceksiniz. Bizler de sizlerin başarılarıyla gurur duyacağız. Bu vesileyle WIPO'ya ve Türk Patent ve Marka Kurumu'na katkılar için bir kez daha teşekkür etmek isterim. Ayrıca... 2015 yılında yapmış olduğumuz protokolümüzün yenilendiğini, önümüzdeki yıl aynı şekilde eğitim öğretime devam edeceğimiz müjdesini de bu vesileyle duyurmak isterim. Our dear alumni, you're on the eve of the completion of one of the world's exceptional programs with the assistance of the three shareholders and our distinguished faculty. You're going to lead national and international policy making. We're going to take pride in your accomplishments. On this occasion, I would like to express my sincere thanks to WIPO and Türk Patent for their tremendous efforts. Moreover, I would like to announce once again that we have extended our protocol for an additional five years and we're going to maintain this excellent program for the forthcoming years. Bugünlerde dünya COVID-19 ve aşı patentlerini tartışırken göz ardı edilmemesi gereken diğer bir konu dijital dönüşüm ve ilerleyen teknoloji ve bunu fiti mülkiyet hukukunda Özellikle patent hukukunda doğuracağız yeni sorunlardır. Bu kapsamda yapay zeka, nesneler interneti, 5G teknolojisi ve standarda esas patentler ön plana çıkmaktadır. Kapanış konferansında da bu konular tüm boyutlarıyla ele alınacak. Değerli panelistlere katkılar için şimdiden teşekkür ediyor. Olası sorunların, cevaplarının ve çözüm yollarının tartışılacağı konferansın verimli geçeceğine inanıyorum. 
While COVID-19 and patents on vaccines are strongly debated nowadays, another issue that deserves attention is digital transformation and progressing technology and the problems that give rise to in uh, terms of patent law. Within this framework, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 5G technology, and standard essential patents are of considerable importance. In this closing conference, these topics will be discussed, focusing on their various aspects. I'd like to thank our panelists today for their contributions in advance and believe that the conference will be fruitful for the discussion of possible problems, answers and solutions. Bir kez daha bu konferansın düzenlenmesinde çok emeği geçen Arzu Oğuz hocama, Habib Asan başkanıma ve Sayın Bradley'e özellikle çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Hem WIPO, hem Ankara Üniversitesi, FISAOM, hem de Türk Patent ve Marka Kurumu hakikaten çok önemli bir organizasyonu gerçekleştirmiş oldu. Onlara hasreten çok teşekkür ediyorum. Verimli bir konferans olmasını diliyorum ve mezunlarımıza da bundan sonraki hayatlarında üstün başarılar diliyor. Ankara Üniversitesi'ni hiç unutmamalarını da temenni ediyor. Herkesi saygıyla, muhabbetle selamlıyorum. I'd like to welcome you all once again and I'd like to especially thank Arzu Uğur, uh, dear Habib Hasan and Mr. Bradley for their uh, contributions. And I wish success for our alumni in their future career and I hope that they will never forget Ankara University. Professor Renouard, thank you very much for your remarks and your um, encouraging words. Uh, for the second opening speech, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Habib Hasan, the president of the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, to take the floor. Uh, Honorable President of Ankara University, Professor Nejda Inuvar, respected head of WIP Academy, Academic Institutions Program, Mr. Joe Bradley, distinguished professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to have this opportunity to address you on this particular event organized by Ankara University on the closing of the 2020-2021 academic year of the Masters of Laws in Intellectual Property Program. I would like to express my appreciation to the Director General of WIPU, Mr. Darren Tank, Director of, Director of WIPU Academy, Mr. Sherif Sadallah, Mr. Joe Bradley and Ms. Marta Chukovare for their efforts in putting this program into effect and their support. I also want to thank uh, to Ank uh, the Ankara University for the successful conclusion of the 2020-2021 academic year of the program. Finally, I would like to thank all the pre uh, presenters and the moderators involved in this conference for their many interesting contributions. Dear participants, this academic year is the fifth year of the Masters of Laws program in intellectual property jointly organized by Ankara University, World Intellectual Property Organization, and the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office. In addition to the benefit of enjoying WIP Academy's tremendous experience and abilities, such as accessing the most competent professors and the contemporary teaching methods, WIPU's existence and intervention in this program provide a unique uh, international prestige. As you know, we are passing through unprecedented times because of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Although we are facing a global health crisis, unlike any in the almost 100 year history, the master's program achieved great success through virtual lectures and virtual workshops. In line uh, with our desire and continuous improve the program's quality, in addition to the virtual patent and trademark search and examination workshop with experienced examiners, we have integrated a virtual design search and examination workshop into the program this year. We are well aware of the importance of the practical skills development and striving to create opportunities for the students every academic year increasingly. We are expanding not only our student and alumni network and faculty members, but also broaden our experience and knowledge circle in IP teaching. Dear participants, 
The theme of the, uh, today's conference is standard essential patterns and the Internet of Things. Digital revolution has made the standard essential patterns one of the most important and controversial issues of the industrial property system. With the rapidly increasing SEP trade in the world, creation, declaration, and the licensing of the standard es essential patterns have become a very important field of activities of IP professionals. Therefore, we thought that this subject would be very beneficial for our graduate students who are at the very beginning of their professional lives. As, we, as, we, as well known, today's interconnected and interactive uh, world is made possible by standards of standard based on patented technologies that enable machines to interact among themselves. A typical consumer product, such as a smartphone, must meet many standards and needs for effectively doing the job. Technical specification of a standard, which are developed by standard developing organizations, enable the patented technology to be distributed under fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, front terms, shortly. Representatives of the industry come together and formalize a license agreement that has to reflect front terms. These standard essential patents are used to obtain a license to market the related products. This interconnection is also used under the Internet of Things technology, which has the estimated economic potential in developed countries up to $9 trillion per year by 2025 in devices for personal use, homes, offices, factories, work sites, retail environment, cities, vehicles, etc. For the successful imp implementation of these standard essential patterns, IP awareness has a crucial role. I would like to thank WIPU and Ankara University again for their valuable efforts to dissemination IP knowledge. As we all know, Strong IP knowledge, is, IP knowledge is essential in informing others about the value and management of IP and studying business, engineering, and technology. So, dear students, congratulations to the class of 2021. As this master program is an excellent opportunity to address the shortage of skilled professionals in intellectual property law, Today, we have now 16 new professionals having deep knowledge in IP from different countries, namely Ethiopia, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Kenya, Malawi, Oman, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and Turkey. I'm pleased to know that as the new graduates, you will be our colleagues working in your respective countries to establish a better, a better IP environment and I am so glad for being a part of this growing IP family. Before concluding my speech, I hope in addition to your academic skills, you now have valuable access to a, to a professional network, which will surely be an important asset for the rest of your life. In this regard, my team at the Turk Patent and I will be glad to have continuous correspondence with you in the future. I congratulate you all on completing the program and you and hope you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Professor Hassan for his remarks as well. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to invite Mr. Joe Bradley, the head of the Academic Institutions Program at WIPO Academy to deliver his speech. Thank you uh, and, and good morning. Uh, Professor Hassan, President of the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, and our good friend, Professor Unavar, Director of Ankara University, Professor Oguz, Director at Ankara University, and distinguished speakers at the IP conference, Professor Godar, Dr. Sahin, and my colleague, Tomoko Miyamoto. Distinguished professors, colleagues, invited guests, distinguished alumni of this LLM and IP program, distinguished participants of the 2021 LLM in IP programme, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the WIPO Academy, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the closing ceremony of the fifth edition of the Master of Laws in Intellectual Property programme 
with specialization in patent and design law, jointly offered by WIPO, the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, and Ankara University. It's also my pleasure to join you for the opening of the IP conference on standard essential patents and the Internet of Things. I would like to give a very warm welcome to all distinguished guests, LLM and IP alumni, and the students in the, this fifth edition of this prestigious master's program. The master program would, of course, not be possible without the enthusiasm and presence of all of you, our distinguished students, our partners, Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, and Ankara University. I'd like to thank in particular Dr. Hassan, the president of the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office, for his unstinting support for the program, as well as the rector of the university, the professors and faculty at Ankara University, for their excellent cooperation and the high quality of their teaching and the remarkable speed at which they were able to adapt to online teaching. We are also especially grateful to the government of Turkey and the Presidency for Turks Abroad and Related Communities for their continued support. Thank you to you all. Unfortunately, due to the impact of COVID-19, we are joining today via a virtual platform. The COVID-19 pandemic has profoundly disrupted all of our lives. This is also true for education systems across the world and forced us all to change the way we conduct our work, our studies and this master programme. That said, the top priority for the WIPO Academy and its partners has been to ensure your safety and well-being, as well as that of the professors, lecturers, experts and staff. While this is the case, there is still much to be thankful for. As Professor Hassan mentioned, the 2021 edition had 16 participants from a number of different countries, and I, will, I won't list them all again. Uh, but it's also important to point out the, the split between male and female participation. And once again, the Academy sees this as an important way of measuring what we do. And I'm happy to say that we had more women participants uh, than men participants in this particular edition. I'm also pleased to learn that many of you excelled in your studies and final exams, and that you're now finalizing your research papers, which should be submitted by the end of this month. Not that I want to give anyone any pressure, but I mentioned that in passing. WIFO congratulates you all for your hard work thus far towards successfully completing the Master of Laws in Intellectual Property. Your brilliant achievement is even more admirable during these challenging times of COVID-19. We fully understand that the journey in completing the master program wasn't easy, but the fact that you've made it this far means that you're also at the start of an exciting new journey. Our hope is that you may always have the same drive and determination exhibited throughout this challenging period to overcome any obstacles and that you will stay motivated to work harder and excel in your careers. Always believe in your dreams and your ability to make those dreams come true. Don't ever doubt the knowledge that you acquired during the master's programme. This knowledge will help you to develop professionally and we hope fulfil your career aspirations. Congratulations once again, and we strongly encourage you to make the most of the strong networks you've established throughout this time. Both the family at Ankara University, at Turk Patent, and the wider support of the WIPO Academy. The graduates from all our joint master's programmes create a pool of talented and highly knowledgeable IP experts. Through their work, their research, writing, teaching and networks, these experts are able to act as channels for the dissemination of IP knowledge for the broader benefit of development. Many of these successful postgraduates have gone on to take up important and senior positions in national IP offices, regional IP offices, universities, industries and strengthening the work of small and medium-sized enterprises as well as law firms. Please do keep in touch with them and with all of us through the WIPO Academy Alumni Network and the Alumni Group on LinkedIn. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as part of this program, it's our pleasure to organise with our partners an annual intellectual property conference on a topical issue which would not have been the subject of so much focus during the master's program. As you know, and as, as has been mentioned, this year's conference is on standard essential patents and the internet of things. 
we will have the privilege to learn from our distinguished speakers who will address three subtopics of special expertise to each of them. The IP conference also gives an opportunity for our master's students and alumni to discuss and engage with the experts on any latest developments in that field. So do take advantage of this opportunity. In conclusion, let me once again join others in congratulating the 2020-21 graduates. Let me thank especially our partners for the great work they're doing at Turk Patent and Ankara University and for their excellent cooperation in the joint offering of the master's degree programme. And we hope that this positive spirit will continue. With these few words, the WIPO Academy wishes you all every success with your careers and a healthy, prosperous future. Thank you. Okay, many thanks to Professor Unuar, Professor Hassan, and Mr. Bradley for their encouraging remarks and their continuous support uh, throughout the conduct of the master's program, uh, as well as for the organization of today's conference. Um, as one of the program coordinators of this master's in IP, I have witnessed endless efforts and hard work that our current batch has put throughout the year uh, firsthand. And this is a challenging master's program, very compact in nature. And on the top of, top of that, having to complete it entirely in the virtual environment rendered it uh, even more challenging. So I also congratulate all our students for their accomplishment and wish our best for their future career. Lastly, we owe a debt of gratitude to all program coordinators and professors who, may, who have made these accomplishments possible. That was the end of the uh, opening session. Uh, before me, we move on with the second session now, just a very brief remark uh, on the mode of discussions. Uh, for those attendees who wish to raise uh, questions, please click the hand icon at the very uh, bottom of the screen so that the moderator can see that you are raising your hand and call, uh, call upon your name to speak. And once uh, you are called upon to speak, you will be unmuted and you will be able to ask your question. Or alternatively, you may also raise your question by typing in the question and answer, the Q&A part, again, at the very bottom of the screen. And in, if you uh, and and then uh, the moderator can see and uh, read your question uh, accordingly. Uh, with this, uh, we have concluded the uh, opening uh, session of our conference today. This is another advantage of uh, virtual meeting. We are almost ahead of our time today, which normally takes uh, several hours to conclude. We are almost ready in, in half, uh, half of an hour. And now I leave you alone with, with the moderators and panelists. So Professor Arzoos, the floor is yours to moderate the first session. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Rector, uh, dear President of uh, Turk Patent, uh, dear Head of the Academic Institutions Program of WIPO. Uh, first of all, this is pleasure for me to come in the 2021 IP conference. As the director of the Ankara University IP Center, FISAM, I would like to extend my gratitude to all the shareholders of our LLM in IP program, to the WIPO, Mr. Bradley and Mrs. Chikofore, and to the Turk Patent, Professor Asan, Dr. Akın, and Dr. Kaya Özsan. I would also like to thank all our program coordinators, our lecturers, and of course, our students and alumni who made it possible to carry out this program successfully for five years. Uh, last but not least, I owe a uh, debt of gratitude uh, to Professor uh, Dr. Nejdet Unuar, the rector of Ankara University for his continued support. Uh, I am also very pleased that our protocol was extended and we are going to maintain this successful partnership to contribute to the IP in a global scale. Coming back to today's conference, uh, our first speaker, Professor Dr. Heinz Godard, is a patent attorney and European patent and trademark attorney, a partner of Bermert, Bermert with his office in Munich, Germany. He has a technical background as well as PhD degree in physics 
He teaches patent and licensing law as an honorary professor at the University of Bremen, Germany, as a lecturer at the Munich Intellectual Property Law Center, as a visiting professor at the University of Washington, Seattle, and the National Changchi University in Taipei, and as a consultant professor at the University of Huazong, Huan, China. He lectures IP law at the Xinhua University School of Law, Beijing. Furthermore, Dr. Godard is an adjunct professor and an honorable consultant in international legal services at the National Yangon University of Science and Technology, uh, Taiwan. He is also a director at the Global Institute of Intellectual Property, Delhi. He is a past president of Less International and of Less Germany and has received the gold medal of Less International and has been an ad persona member of the EPO Standing Advisory Committee during the years 2018-2020. Without any delay, I would like to invite Professor Gadar to deliver his presentation on patent system solutions for artificial intelligence and Internet of Things inventions. Please, the floor is yours, Professor Gadar. Yeah, thank you so much. Dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, dear students particularly, and participants in the conference, it is um, unnecessary to say that I am very pleased to give you a little presentation and also to be able to join this program. I regret very much not to be in physically in Turkey now. I have been many times, I could say many times, not only a few times in Istanbul. I never ever, I must confess, I have been to Ankara. So might be that will change at some point of time, but Istanbul and various universities and institutions here like talk, but then whatever in Istanbul are pretty well known to me and I love the city and uh, I love the South Coast. I love the West Coast of Turkey, which I know all very well, but Ankara, has escaped me, I must say. So, somewhere in future, hopefully. Next, very important, I think. I heard what the moderator has so nicely said, what we will uh, do with questions, etc. When I listen to a difficult subject, I hope I can make it as simple as possible during my presentation to all of you. Uh, I come to the idea that I should better have asked certain questions when I'm at home or in my office or the conference and the presentation is over. Please do not hesitate. The organizers have my email address, of course. Whenever there's a question open left, which was not sufficiently handled by you, it's never the mistake, of course, of anybody who, of somebody who would like to ask this question. It's always the fault of the presenter namely me. So don't hesitate to send me directly or indirectly an email. I'll be happy to answer the questions as much as I can. Um, maybe uh, not to the extent, but first of all, it will be cost-free. This is always the critical thing because I have two heads, of course. One is as a senior uh, partner of a rather big law, IP law firm in Germany. Uh, and the other one is my academic life, where really my heart is living for, I would to say. But this will be all cost-free, of course. It should all not only not go to very specific problems, like I got it in Saudi Arabia somewhere nearly 15 years ago. I was often for certain reasons in Saudi Arabia, where I got then, you have so nicely said that you do uh, answer these questions and solve these problems cost-free. Then I got about 30 pages of an invention description, could you please transform this into a European patent application? That would become something which is professional work and I would not promise to do cost-free. Having said this, it's a great pleasure to be here. First of all, why do I feel justified to talk about patent system solutions and in the same time also access for AI and IoT inventions, as I have briefly called it in the title of my presentation. You will have seen or will know, maybe it is even in the conference papers that I recently uh, had the pleasure to be invited to write article in a festschrift, as we call it, a special number of GUR this year um, in honor of my dear old, fr uh, old friend, Professor Peter Meyerbeck. He is now, and you will see how closely these things are related 
to each other. He is now the presiding judge of the Cartel Senate of the German Federal Court of Justice or Supreme Court. Let's call it briefly. Before that, until about one year and a half, two years ago, he was the presiding judge of the 10th Senate, the famous or infamous patent Senate of the German Supreme Court. And he, by his change from the patent Senate to the cartel Senate is a living indicator, so to say, how closely particularly questions of access to technologies, which otherwise, if dominant positions are abused, could be blocked by patents, because the whole SEP problems and attempts to solve them are now handled in German court system as the highest instance, no longer by the patent senate, but by the competition. Field. And Dr. Bacher, the presiding judge of the Patent Senate, a successor of Peter Meyer Beck, who has been for a long time a judge in that court already. And I and many other people have discussed this question for a while. And I try to give you my ideas in a condensed form now in this little presentation here. Without wasting any further time, what is the problem with AI and IoT related inventions? I think the biggest problem first is that we do not wish to give up the wonderful opportunities given by the patent system to incentivize investment into R&D. And this is all over the place the same, whether it is pharma, whether this is telecommunication, whether these are computer-related inventions whatsoever. We would certainly not wish to give that up, so we will have in the Internet of Things, and already now with the increasing number of standards, 5G, who speak still of 5G, 6G, 7G, this is where people in Shenzhen and beyond are working on. We will have much, much, much more patents. We will have thickets of patents, and it will be more and more difficult to penetrate them. Should that encourage us to reduce patentability of certain inventions, to create just simple, simply create fewer patents in all these fields which are critical in order to have the tickets not available, I think that would be totally the wrong way. Because the patent system itself shows us already possibilities nowadays. They have never practically never been used in no country seriously to solve problems which come now up where you do not only connect human beings, cars, things in the internet by zillions and zillions of data carriers by messages which you just need to do without latency, the connection between a brake of a car and the wheel and you don't do, wish, certainly not wish to do this in a weight saving electrical car in future or, not, or an autonomous car by mechanical means anymore, much too heavy, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will have more pets. Should we avoid this? I think no. For me, AI system protecting patents are nothing else than computer implemented inventions or subjects which can be protected by computer implemented inventions. And certainly my colleagues, my discussion partners in the European Patent Office think in a very, very similar manner. We will not have a problem to patent AI inventions in the future. Now look, however, at the following problem and the solutions we need to solve that additional problem. Assuming you make AI inventions, considering them as a tool to make something out of them, as easily patentable. Now, there might be an AI system which has the purpose of collecting thousands of data, millions of data of flight data which you get from jets using engines with certain turbine blades and you collect all these data it is actually done both by airbus by bombardier by boeing whatever you call it out of these data these systems learns the system learns how to improve the turbine blades 
because you might then have turbine blades which have a lower weight, which are particularly strong only in certain regions where you need strength, particularly they are thinner in other things. They are heat resistant in certain parts, not so heat resistant in other parts. And a wonderful unforeseeable turbine blade comes out if you apply this AI system and maybe a 3D printer connected there to, to make these beautiful new turbine blades. Question number one, who is the inventor of these turbine blades which you create? Is it the AI system or is it the person who invented the AI system? Is it possibly both? The one creating the system, the tool, and also the one who implements the tool to solve a specific task. In any case, a turbine blade comes out. Unforeseeable, very similar, by the way, and I should mention this at this point of time because it plays a big role in the discussions which I have, for example, with Peter Meyer Beck and Klaus Bacher on these questions in a little circle where we discuss these things always. It's the same as with research tools in pharma. And you have probably all not still in your memory that 20, 30 years ago, nearly already, it was decided by the boards of appeal before that, the opposition divisions of the EPO, no reach through claims. A patent claim at the end of a set of claims in something like a research tool protecting patent, which says product found made with the aid of the system as mentioned above, not patentable. We might have to rethink this. We might have to come to AI systems where we say, okay, if something is made by that AI system, it is still due to the merit and the efforts of the first inventor who invented that system, maybe including then the application person, the implementer at the end of the day, but a rich through claim would be very useful. We have to revisit this question. I'm absolutely sure about this. Now, assuming, however, we have in some manner patented the AI system. What if now somebody says, okay, this system with a 3D printer is to make turbine blades, but I have the idea one could also make something different out of it. One could, for example, try to improve the disc brakes of cars by similar data collection. Uber does this, by the way, this is not a secret, it was publicly said recently by the head of patent department in a panel in virtually United States in which I participated. And out of this, you will find then driving data, breaking data and come to similar considerations and problems as with turbine blades. You wish to reduce the weight, you wish to increase the strength, you wish to be more location specific with the properties of these disc brakes or disc discs for brakes in cars and an AI, AI system can do this. And now you wish to use the patented AI system we have talked about, which has been made in order to improve turbine blades and is used for that. Now you come to a similar thing as the second medical use patents actually in pharma, where aspirin is well known since a couple of years actually to treat, for example, headache, but you now find a totally new thing, cancer fighting whatsoever, maybe even COVID-19 fighting, I don't know. Now, first question is, you wish now to find out whether this system, this patented system is useful to make solutions also to other problems than turbine blades. What do you need in order to find out? You need to do experiments on and with that AI system. Is it suitable for these other purposes? Does it need to be modified? Do you need different, which you certainly will need, data sets in order to train it in a self-learning manner to be able to solve these disc brake related automobile industry related questions. And so you need a generous experimental use clause. You need something which I'm a German, so I speak about the German patent law. I'm nearly sure that you have in Turkey also similar things and in many other countries where the audience today comes from. We have in Germany Article 11.2, which unrestrictedly of the Patent Act allows experiments on 
patented inventions. This goes much, much farther than the Ebola exemption in the United States and a special one, Article 11.2a in Germany, which allows tests for clinical trials and preclinical trials in order to develop pharmaceuticals. No, it is a general experimental use clause. So let's say easily patented and many, many of these systems will be patented AI system, which are patented, then you can use it according to this generous experimental use clause in order to find improvements, to find out, to build improvements, if you wish to say, by special applications of this AI system to new problems. So that problem is solved. Researchers will be happy. You can do your experiments and you get a wonderful now AI system with 3D printer for disc brakes of cars. Fantastic. Now we have another problem. You probably would like to use commercially that product. You would like to introduce it into the marketplace. You would like to sell it. Even commercially possessing it would be otherwise patent infringement. Can you do this? Big problem in principle, but we need an opening clause, a deblocking provision for all these kinds of improvement patents inventions protected by secondary patents. And there we need something like, in Germany, it is very simple. It is Article 24.2 of our Patent Act, which gives the possibility to get a compulsory license in a very special sense. It is a compulsory cross license. That means the inventor of this secondary invention has the right and title without public interest to be checked to request the owner of the primary patent to grant a license. And it comes at a price. Also, then the owner of the primary patent is entitled to use this secondary invention. That means our inventor, whom we have just tried to construe here, the one who has invented the AI system with 3D printer to make turbine blades, has now also the the right to make disc brakes for cars and vice versa. By the way, this does not come in any manner without cost or royalties. There is no prohibition in Article 24.2 of German Patent Act that this cross-licensing should come only at the price of cross-licensing. No, there can be balancing and should be, of course, streams of royalties in one or the other direction or both directions, which take care of the different kinds of merits these two different inventors on the different levels may have. And has this article ever been used? No. But I think it would be an excellent way to open then the market also for products which have been made as important improvements of patented articles and bring then these articles to mankind for the benefit of many people, other industries, etc. I'm sure, and certain judges in Germany at least, which I, whom, I, whom I mentioned already, think that this will necessarily come in the further development of application of patent laws. So what I'm saying is, there are two treasures in the present patent system. By the way, in India, where I work with Lakshmi Kumaran, a lot of these questions are only on these questions. We also publish from time to time on them. Um, he's a good friend of mine in uh, Delhi and other places, Bengaluru in India. Uh, in Indian patent law, there is a similar provision. Even British patent law, I say even because sometimes you close up, you come with all due respect to um, Anglo-Saxon and more US-centric systems, you don't find all these improvements anymore, which we have as a matter of course, more or less in our continental, at least European patent laws. So we have two treasures. Two, two treasures. We have the possibility, the first possibility is to do unrestricted experimental use, to create improvements. Secondly, the possibility to give access there to by something like compulsory cross-licensing, which, by the way, will never be necessarily be used. This is like this the normal compulsory license in a robust compulsory license system, like in Germany, uh, according to Article 24.1. Uh, reasonable parties will nearly always agree on reasonable conditions, how you would get access to the patent technology, patented technology, how you would 
structure the mutual rights and duties of a primary inventor and a secondary inventor, no problem. But I think the sovereign, and I firmly believe in that, the sovereign should always have the possibility in case that the people are not reasonable to make them reasonable. And this is why these provisions have to be there. And I think they are excellent solutions. Now we come to another problem, and I would like to use the last 10 minutes of my presentation for that purpose. We do not have only the problem that easy patentability, generous patentability of AI inventions, and it goes beyond that in the age of Internet of Things, etc., needs access to patented technologies in many, many fields, particularly AI fields. But we also have another problem, namely in the world of standards. There we have a totally different kind of access problem. And um, we maybe find this here on, the, on this slide. Thank you very much. This is exactly what I wanted to talk now about. We have this problem with so-called standard essential patents, which Assuming now it is real standard essential patents, the first thing which is necessary to deal with that problem from my viewpoint is of course to determine what is really an essential patent, which you cannot avoid in order to make your phone talking with another phone, etc. And my personal assumption is based on many talks with clients of mine, one of my bigger clients uh, in uh, particular telecommunication uh, sits in Shenzhen. I don't need to mention any name, I think here you all know it. And I know how much, of course, in standards, uh, in so-called portfolios of standard essential patents, you have patents which are not really essential. I would say about 10% may be essential, the other 90% not. So the first step would also be to or what would already be to determine what is really essential. And then of course, there is this problem who does not get a license under that patent or that portfolio of patent, cannot build a phone, simple example here, which can speak with another phone on a certain standard. To give it very, very simple. What is at the moment the practice? At the moment, you know, we have big lawsuits in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in China, suits, enter suits, enter, enter, enter suits, etc., etc. And uh, the courts of the world are full of that, and the legal profession to whom I also belong are quite happy about this, of course, because it is a lot, a lot of, uh, well, thinking is just pleasure, but also of money which is involved in litigation industry in order to try to solve these questions. It's all because of the present practice. The present practice says Etsy, for example, the European Telecommunication Standard Institute in Paris, that somebody who declares a patent as standard essential, and everybody must carefully do this, because if you don't, you create certain um, difficulties for newcomers later on, because you have patented something, and he didn't know that this is patented, and produces a product or some people will innocently introduce it into a standard and only later on you have an ambush which you have created. So they declare very generously, standard essential patents. There's nothing wrong in doing that. And then everybody who declares such a patent as standard essential has to write an offer to the public, let's say that she or he is, is willing to give a license under fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. We had this already here today in the very instructive in so far in all other aspects, also introductory speeches today, uh, conditions, everybody. Now, according to German law, you have already a big problem with that because what is this offer? It is certainly not a contract. So you do not conclude by writing such a letter a license contract in accordance with Article 15 of German Patent Act, which would stick to the patent. If the patent change, own, changes ownership, is sold to other persons, whatever, the license would go with it. The friend declaration would work. We have legal constructions making it hopefully sure, but the last word is not paid by Supreme Courts of this world in so far that this also applies to the normal friend declaration, but it is certainly a problem. And then the problem comes that at least German civil courts, I must confess it is my impression, have practically proven as to be unable to, unwilling might, might even say, 
but I would also say unable to determine friend conditions in an acceptable manner. Why? If there is one standard essential patents, there are a thousand other standard essential patents. One would have to look at all of them to find a solution for a friend rate which have to follow a certain what we call top-down approach in order to avoid such a high overall stack royalty on the final products that the product would practically be unmarketable and therefore, thereby you would create another competition obstacle that some newcomer builds a new food, et cetera. This does not work. But there would be another solution embedded in patent laws of many countries and certainly in German Patent Act. And this is the license of right declaration according to Article 23 of German Patent Act. Many other countries have a similar provision. I have investigated this for the European Commission some years ago. We are discussing this in Brussels and DG Grow all the time. Solution not yet been found, but it says the following. Assuming you would force as a standard setting organization, a newcomer, or not a newcomer, everybody who declares a patent as standard essential, not only to write this nice friend letter, but to register a license of right at the respective patent office, say for Germany at the German Patent and Trademark Office. Then everybody else, for example, a newcomer, for example, a competitor, could, as a matter of law, get a license under this SEP. And if the parties cannot agree, and this is the nice thing, you come to Article 23, 4 of German Patent Act, then the Patent Office determines the royalty. So civil courts would not have to do this anymore. The patent offices can do this. I know that the United Kingdom Intellectual Property Office is very much interested in finding such a solution also in an arbitration-like procedure, possibly in-house. So the parties, the patentee and the newcomer, the licensee, would then have to deal with this question of what the reasonable royalty should be at the patent office appeal in Germany to the Federal Court of Justice. Much more, I would say, competent persons. There are technical people. We have a board of arbitration for employees' inventions at the German Patent and Trademark Office, closely related to industry, having to do with determining license, con license conditions for portfolios, for single inventions all the time. They have about, as you know, per year, about 200 cases to handle. These are published. We have a wealth of decisions what royalty rates should be in certain technical fields. So I am a promoter of the idea, replace the friend letter or add to the friend letter obligation of the SEP owner also the obligation to register a license of right. Then you take out of the civil courts the determination of friend royalties into patent offices and competent institutions. And it would be a nice idea if one could use already existing, usually voluntary, arbitration mechanisms in those patent offices to expand their tasks by, for solving also this question. And last but not least, another solution might be, and this is the solution, I think, for standard essential patents anyway, they should all have to be given to a pool with a license to the pool administrator to sub-license and then under, for instance, German law that would stick according to Article 15 of our patent law to the patent transfer would not uh, take this away anymore, this obligation. And then the administrator of the much, let's say, enlarged task of the uh, administrator would be to determine the reasonable royalties mutually to be paid to be members of the pool and also to be given to outsiders who would enter. This is all I have to say. And I think WIPO, one of the organizations here, WIPO and Talk Patent, of course, and Ankara University, to organize this here has a very, very wonderful institution already, the WIPO Mediation and, uh, and Arbitration Center. And that could play a tremendous role in this determination of friend rates to give access to these portfolios, that means access to SEP protected technologies. This is the second problem we have, that we have a different kind of patents. SEPs are not normal patents. They have a much 
higher power to enable patentees beyond the content, which is guaranteed as scope of protection, etc., by law to patentees um, than normal patents have, we need to solve that problem. And there, arbitration and whether compulsory, maybe compulsory in the sense that you would not be allowed without being blamed for abusing your patent in a dominant position as an SAP owner. You have to go through arbitration and only then you can go to court, something like this. These are all solutions in our present systems, both in the law and also in mechanisms which uh, and organizations which have been created already and are available, ready to go, like in WIPO mediation and arbitration system. That's all for today, and I hope we have an interesting discussion later on. Thank you so much. Professor Godard, thank you very much for this very stimulating presentation. Uh, you are always very welcome to Ankara. Uh, in, on contrary, uh, I spent uh, six years uh, of my life in Munich, and I love this city. And I was <laughs> visiting the city okay, very often before pandemic. <laughs> and we will see each other. Good. Yes. Okay. Maybe in Ankara or in Munich. Thank you very much again. <laughs> Okay, artificial intelligence and Internet of Things are definitely fascinating developments and it forces us to rethink some of the established concepts in patent law, in particular standard essential patents and grant terms. Without any delay, I would like to move on with the questions raised by the audience. Okay, do we have any questions? To uh, Professor Godard? Okay. I don't see any question. Mr. Guman, you don't see also. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I, I okay. You see. explained yeah. everything very, very clear and very, very perfect. And <laughs> okay. Uh, it seems there is no question. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Tomoko Miyamoto. She has a question, please. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, first of all, to Dr. Goldal for the excellent presentation, a very interesting one. Um, since uh, there is no question raised, uh, maybe I'll just try to be the icebreaker <laughs> for the question and answer session. Um, actually, I have um, the question relating to the license of right system where the patent of uh, the parties can go to the uh, can sort of well the patent holder can voluntarily agree to license to other uh, whoever who wanted to use the patent as i understand it mm -hmm. and if there is no agreement between the parties it will be a patent office who will determine the standard essential patent royalty rate. Now, in that case, the patent examiners or the staff of the patent office who are usually doing patent examination, maybe they are the technical experts in the, in the technical field, but they are not necessarily uh, familiar with uh, business models or economic impact of the technology uh, in, in this business setting of the parties concerned. Now, uh, do you think that would be the appropriate place to resolve these kind of disputes or rather the courts uh, because in the court procedures, there are more possibility to ask for the, I don't know, ev gathering evidence or for testimonies. Would that be better to have a more holistic and comprehensive understanding? That is my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. A very interesting question. It's interesting enough that um, only, or, well, only the Japanese Patent Office and JETRO, they a couple of years ago already were and are continuing to do so, a very great interest in the German LOR system and its possibility to use it eventually, possibly, um, for these questions 
via law system as we have talked about. I was with the delegation of uh, JPO two times actually, actually, uh, yeah, uh, in um, um, uh, the German Ministry for Economy and Energy, as it is nowadays called, uh, which supervises the German national standardization organizations, uh, DEAN and uh, ZVEI, etc. And we discussed this system in detail, and the German ministry is very much in favor. They are talking with the commission in DG Grow continuously, whether one should not introduce such a system. And we had it up to the level that the German patent office was even there uh, at that time under Vice President Schmitz. Still, he retired a couple of years ago, um, and we discussed these possibilities and everybody agreed, also the heads of uh, the German Deep Institute um, and uh, his deputy, uh, Mr. Barker and Dr. Marquardt, and the only solution was that the patent office says, yes, we can do this, but we need more personnel. So please, dear ministry, give us some additional, which I fully understand, personnel. But the basis why this would be suitable, particularly in Germany, is the following. We have already at the German Federal Patent Office, uh, at the German Patent Office, this board of arbitration for employees' inventions. That consists in each a specific case, which they have to handle, of a legally trained chair and two examiners from the technical fields. Exactly what you just said, technical people and a legal person. How do they know about industry reality, licensing conditions. And they determine 200 times a year license conditions as a basis for determining the value for invention as a basis for calculating employee invention remuneration. So how do they do this? The reason is as follows. They have at the board of arbitration, at the hand of the chair, two pools of licensing experts, one from industry, one from the trade union. I think it is 12 per party. They are always determined for two years, I think, and they are usually not used. They are used in the employee invention system in case that one of the parties, the employer or the employee, wishes to have the board of arbitration of three persons, two examiners and the legal person, enlarged by two more persons, one from the trade union side, one from the employer side. Forget about the trade unions in this context now. This pool of experts from the industry, this comes from chemical industry, automotive, pharma, and you name it. It is for two years, this pool of experts, out of which the next, the, the second, the, the industry judge, so to say, or if you wish, so arbitrator is called into specific cases where the parties wish it, that there are five persons and deciding, the two examiners, the chair, and the two representative, employer and employee, they are always at the hand of the board of arbitration. And they are always asked. Then they go back to their Verband German, how they are, uh, Association of German Car Industry, uh, Verband Deutscher Chemiker of Chemical Industry. And they inquire then, what are at the moment the usual royalties we pay for tire components or for a certain, a certain coverage for, I don't know what, for a car uh, which uh, has bad weather conditions, etc. So they are there. And this pool of experts, which is for other reasons available already, could be used by an expansion of the present task of the Board of Arbitration, not only to deal with employee inventions, rather to do also this type of friend determination. In any case, royalty determination in accordance with Article 23.4. Article 24 at the moment is very seldom used, as you know. I made for JetPro at that time an investigation, I think it was per year 4,000 times, because at the moment, the only advantage of somebody uh, uh, registering a license of right is that he pays half of the annuities for the future for the patent. That's it. So practically uses that is the last resort before you give up your patent, but it could become a very fruitful system in terms of having a sovereign controlled patent office controlled system where you could determine friend rates which a permanent expert staff available, a pool of experts, which would not, like in a civil court, need to call in experts of both parties who in Germany usually uh, they are used, but the courts don't uh, consider experts usually as so important uh, as in Anglo-Saxon uh, 
Accords, for example, is a different culture. And uh, that is the, the reason behind. Also, the examiners can't do it. They are used, however, together with a legal judge in the board of arbitration to determine royalties all the time. But they do this always with industry relation. We have the connection to industry by the pool of experts, which are parts of the enlarged board of arbitration. And if I would change the task, I could do similar things. I think keep, um, United Kingdom Intellectual Property Office has similar systems, not for employees' inventions, but for arbitration purposes. And certainly you could do this in a system like in Bible arbitration and radiation center, no problem. You would just use out of what they have available. This would, one could do this, for example, in that manner, that somebody would say in its patent law or patent practice, even Germany could do this, where they would say, in case that the question is raised to the German patent office, they outsource this to an institution like, and then become the closer to the sovereign, the more, uh, the, the less, I would say, uh, industry interest driven by individual companies, etc. you would come to a more acceptable solution and could outsource the whole thing. Thank you very much. Sorry, long answer to a very simple, but very well-founded question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is another question uh, from Chris. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. As you mentioned about artificial intelligence is kind of collecting data from many sources can as a tools and it can be learned by itself to processing something. As far as I know, in some country, artificial intelligence can be protected as copyright as database. How do you see about it? Yeah, this is another question uh, I would like to, yeah, of course. Um, I believe that also somebody who collects data, let's say our Uber people whom I just mentioned because there was on a panel and this public, uh, could be anybody else. As soon as somebody makes data available in a structured form, preferably, at a readable surface, which can be used by an AI system, I believe, first of all, that this is an inventive act already. That means the act of struct structuring and bringing to a user surface data in a manner which can be used by an AI system is, first of all, patentable. And secondly, is an important part in all these things. Now we come to a difficult problem, however. What to do with the data as such? Let's assume there is a data, a set of data, which must be used in order to work with that AI system. The reader of the AI patent will not have these data. They are mentioned, you have them. Would it not be necessary, and I'm discussing this with many people, to have a depository for data, a confidential one, accessible only under controllable conditions, like we have it for indigenous knowledge, for biotech uh, basis, inventions, etc., uh, in order to make the patent workable? That means would not somebody patenting such an AI system in order to avoid the blaming uh, to be blamed for having patented something which is unworkable, thereby not given, thus giving sufficient teaching uh, for the ordinary person skilled in the art to exercise that patent, to deposit at the same time the necessary data he has used somewhere that must be fairly confidential. Actually, I have proposed this already to the mediation center we are talking about, new tasks possibly, where could that be? I think WIPO again would be an ideal um, institution uh, to store these data, which must be controlled, and then we will come and foresee big problems. There are certain countries, we have had this in domain names, as you know, who wish to have on their territory these data collections, very dangerous. It would have to be a neutral institution under very well-defined conditions to open this data in order to make a reader of an AI patent able to use the AI patent, either for the purpose where the AI patent has been written for, or for other purposes to improving it, etc. So long, long answer again. First of all, data collection and presenting from my viewpoint must be patentable. Secondly, the data as, the, as such, the which are not part of the structure, et cetera, but these are the data which are collected, should be also protected in some manner. This is secret know-how. It should be opened out of the secrecy uh, under certain controlled conditions, and there should be a depository. We have one in Budapest for biotech things, 
for biological interventions, but we don't have one for data, nowhere, but it is necessary to have one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, there is a comment uh, of our good friends, Professor Duncan Matthews. Uh, oh. Professor Godard is correct that the UK EPO has system for non-binding opinions on the validity of patents okay. and uh, also a mediation service for IP disputes between parties, he wrote. Interesting. I'm, I'm very much interested in that. I know that uh, in the time when, when uh, our dear friend, uh, uh, Lord Justice Letty was still with us, uh, he told me a little bit that it was planned. I don't know how the present status is. The United Kingdom, unfortunately, is drifting a little bit away from the intention of continental um, patent systems and scholars, etc. But uh, I'm very grateful that I was right. And uh, that could be further developed, I think, yes. Uh, okay, it seems uh, that was the end of the question and answers and comments. Before we exceed the time limit, I would like to thank Professor Godard and the audience who raised their questions and comments. Uh, last but uh, last least, I would like to thank all the organizers of this conference and our IP Research Center team, Dr. Selin Özden, Dr. Zehra Özkan and Koray Güven. Congratulations to our students for their achievements, and I am leaving the floor to Mr. Cemil Başpınar to moderate the second session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Oz. So I, I would like to congratulate you and Professor Goder for this uh, excellent session. Uh, I have the pleasure to welcome you all to the second session of today's conference. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of uh, this event for inviting me to moderate this session. Uh, I also thank Göksu from Turk Patent and Koray from Ankara University for handling the preparation uh, issues perfectly. I also take this opportunity to congratulate the graduates of this IP Masters program, and I wish them every success in their future professional life. I also congratulate the lecturers, the professors, and the stakeholders of this very successful uh, IP master's program, Ankara University, WIPO, and Turkish Patent and Trademark Office. Dear colleagues, dear participants, in this session, our topic is the inter interdependency between core R&D and standard essential patents for 5G and IoT technologies. So far, much has been said on the importance of standard essential patents by, by the distinguished previous speakers. It really seems obvious that standard essential patents will maintain their critical role, particularly in the telecommunication technologies. And this will make the creation of high quality IPs, potential standard essential patents, much more important than ever for the, for the companies. So today we'll be focusing more on relation between the creation uh, of standard essential patents and basic core research and R&D. And we'll get uh, this from, from the perspective of a very successful company. Our speaker, Dr. Onur Shahin is a senior manager in one of the leading research and innovation companies in the world. Therefore, his participation is really important and valuable for us. So we'll have the chance to benefit from his expertise and vast experience in the area. So before leaving the floor, I, uh, I am pleased to share some main points from his biography, from his successful career. Onur Shahin received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from Middle East Technical University in Ankara in 2003. He was admitted to New York University PhD program in the same year and during his graduate study studies, he conducted research on information theory and its application on wireless communications. In part of his PhD studies, he worked at Philips R&D department as a researcher and received his PhD degree in 2009. 
Dr. Shahin joined the wireless R&D company InterDigital and worked on early stage research activities in 5G projects. He is currently a senior manager in the same company and leads multiple 6G research and development projects. Dr. Shahin has around 30 patents and patent applications, 60 peer-reviewed scientific publications with over 1,700 citations. He received several prestigious innovation and best paper publication awards throughout his career, including 2018 IEEE Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award. Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Onur Shine for his presentation. Mr. Shine, thank you for joining us today. So the floor is thank yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bajpanar. First of all, um, I should admit I am humbled to be part of this distinguished uh, speakers. And I would like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Koray Güven and Mr. Cemal Bajpınar for, for the invitation to this excellent program um, webinar. Um, and I would like to congratulate the graduates and look forward to working with you. Hopefully our, our uh, roads will cross at one point. Um, just to start with, and I share my screen as I speak, um, I am here as an individual. I'm not representing any company. Um, and I'm not an IP professional either. Um, who am I? I am an engineer by training and profession. Uh, I'm a researcher doing R&D over the last 15 years, and I'm an inventor. Um, I have, um, uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, my professional career being uh, developed on inventing technologies and uh, hopefully commercializing them. And uh, we already mentioned about the title in this presentation. I will try to describe how core R&D and, and patents uh, interrelate to each other in the context of 5G and IoT technologies. So uh, to set the stage, telecommunications is a very good example where we could see how R&D and IP businesses or areas come together and literally change our lives. So as we speak uh, in this virtual world, um, we are seeing how this has translated into, into something concrete. Five years ago, we would not have to be able to do this conference virtually. Uh, we wouldn't have this uh, high data rates sitting in our homes, offices, et cetera, and connecting from all over the world. And uh, even this shows how tremendous this technology is in impacting our lives. So it's pretty much fair to say that telecommunications became the digital era nervous system and uh, I would like to very clearly mention that this has been an achievement of R&D people as well as IP professionals and them bringing this into a commercially viable uh, market and uh, changing our lives. So it's, it is a collective effort um, and, and I'll try to explain how this works again in the context of different generations of telecommunications. So, just a very quick history. Uh, I'm pretty sure our graduates will not remember most of these Gs. Um, so, uh, every, so the first generation in Talco was an analog era. Maybe you will remember from the movies, you see these big phones sitting in the cars of, of uh, some people in 1980s. And then comes in 2G in 1990s, the digital era, the very first I would argue the, one of the most disruptive technologies where we started having the digital mobile phones and, and most of us started getting those in our pockets. And um, every generation comes with a disruptive use case uh, or application. And remember in 2G, it was SMS. All of us were messaging to each other and then came the 3G technologies. Uh, the disruptive use case of 3G was putting internet to our mobile phones to connecting each other. And it was the very first attempt of, of the video communications. Um, and, and a very, um, I would say a joke or, or health joke, I should say in our community, we usually say that um, after 1G, the old numbers are actually failure in generations, but even numbers are success. Um, 3G, so the, the reason being is that in the old numbers, we usually lay out the, the vision of how the technology should be, and the upcoming even generation resolves the underlying problems. So that pretty much 
happened in 4G technologies. In 3G technology, the argument I remember was everything will be connected, everyone will be able to talk over video, did not happen. And then in 4G technologies, we really nailed it. So uh, we started talking over videos and stuff. And then again, yet another odd number generation 5G, very, very ambitious, fantastic uh, vision. And um, which I will describe uh, the timeline as well. Uh, it has started giving some of its promises, uh, but I, we will hopefully see. I'm fa fairly confident that we will see the real innovation, the real use case, disruptive use cases in, in the upcoming generation. So what is 5G and IoT? Uh, again, it's a vision. 5G is a vision technology and IoT is component of this vision. So the start rate, um, the argument was, and the initial principle was, a communication entity, a mobile phone is not only a high data rate, very fast data rate node. We should be able to connect pretty much every electronic device in the world with each other. So that came with the machine type communications use case, which is IoT, it's the other word for IoT really. Um, and under this IoT applications, we have some smart city applications where in a city uh, from your uh, lamppost uh, to your uh, trucks, um, all of them are connected and they smartly engage. That's one or in a home environment, every electronic device is connected to each other. And uh, on the other angle of this, not only these devices should be able to communicate with each other, but we, the 5G should come up with this laser type or ultra reliable low latency technology uh, where a connectivity, wireless connectivity will be on par with the wired technology as if we have a fiber connection between two entities, even though you are sitting at one end of the world to each other. So this fantastic technology will be extremely important for self-driving cars. Actually, without it, we don't see how self-driving cars will even work and some mission critical applications such as remote uh, surgery. So a doctor sitting in a country and operating in an, in an underprivileged country, maybe 5,000 miles, kilometers away. And obviously this enhanced mobile broadband, we will get to see much faster connectivity technologies so that we will not only enable uh, to the video, maybe uh, we will get to see 3D or even holographic communications. So 5G, presented this vision and IoT being part of it. Uh, and a tagline, we as researchers, as inventors, we keep asking, okay, is this the end of the mobile phone? So this square, so usually black or white uh, device. So this artificial fly device is in our pocket. So are we going to see that or is it going to disappear? On my personal opinion, my personal thinking, uh, gut feeling, let's say that we will get to see a new form factor, a new device in the upcoming 10 years, and we will not be carrying these mobile phone devices anymore in our pockets. Just my personal thing. So as I mentioned, I'm not here as a representative of a company. However, it's the company I work for. It's a very successful company, interdigital, uh, mainly based in US, but it has presence in continental Europe as well as in Asia. Uh, what is the company? It's one of the largest pure research innovation and licensing companies in the world. It's been doing wireless innovation over four decades now, quite pioneering wireless innovation. And uh, now it has expanded this expertise into AI and visual technologies as well. Um, so obviously, uh, once you work in an innovative area, you cannot just have core areas, but you, you get to work on emergence areas as well. Uh, co uh, co quantum computing being one, synthetic content, content being other, so on and so forth. Um, so with this core R&D, the product goes into the global standard. So you might argue or ask, okay, companies doing this peer research and innovation. So what, so what is the output? So the output goes to the uh, contributions to global standards. So what does the company have? Uh, the company has around 28,000 patents um, owned by itself and critical to say 90%, maybe over 90% of these patents are created by 
internal R&D. Uh, so it's not, uh, I would say, uh, you, you know, a patent, it's a patent holder company, but it's not necessarily out and buying patent portfolios, rather it prefers to design its own patent portfolio. When we look at the um, segmentation, uh, most of it is again in wireless and video technologies, but there's a significant portion in IoT technologies as well and digital TV. Um, I, may, I already mentioned uh, the core R&D uh, is an input to a machinery, and this machinery is uh, two primary standardizations. The first one being 3GPP, which defines the generations I mentioned. It literally puts the 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G tags on a technology. And the other one is IETF, which defines the internet technologies, internet standards how we communicate over the web, et cetera. So these innovations have translated into over 6,000 contributions to these standard defining organizations in the last 20 years. And also another critical SDO that we, the company participates is, is called IEEE 11 It's the Wi-Fi technology that we all use. We are, I am currently using that technology over 1,000. And this has been done by close to 300 engineers and mostly being PhDs in their expertise fields. And important to note that over 20, even more actually of the revenue, not the profit is directly invested into R&D since, since 2000. Uh, again, this is not um, explaining one specific company, but uh, having some, having, uh, spending some time at Philips and interacting with so many companies in the ecosystem every major company that you know or, or other companies around me have a very similar structure and the interaction of the R&D and IP and translating into standards contributions is very similar. So please see this in the context of how an R&D company contributes to standards. Um, yeah, I have already thrown some keywords, uh, main standards you all very well know. Uh, I also mentioned about uh, core R&D. So what is really the interrelation among these players, among these elements? So um, generation is actually a very structured, a very structured entity. So at the top of it comes the regulatory bodies. So it could be ITU, International Telecommunications Union, or it could be national administrations. Uh, and these are really government level, global organizations. And then they feed into the SDOs, the standard developing organizations. I mentioned already 3GPP, IEEE, IETF, so on and so forth. Obviously from regulatory bodies comes the limitations, requirements, so on and so forth to standard organizations. And then they feed into technical standards. This, for instance, we could say, map into 4G, 5G, 3G, et cetera. And these, these STOs primarily uh, with the guidance of the regulatory bodies, they define the product certification and very importantly in our wireless domain spectrum regulation, et cetera. And these collectively define the products uh, that we are all using now. It could be an operator, which, what, whichever operator you might be using or the product vendor, whichever phone or uh, laptop you might be using. So this is the typical engagement interaction of the key players, uh, stakeholders in this ecosystem. So uh, let's look very briefly, quick time check. Let's very quickly look at the um, 5G generation and the timeline perspective. So how long does it take? Um, this, this information is usually underlooked by a lot of people, including some of the IP professionals they I had the I interact with as well. So um, I, as I mentioned, uh, the guidance, the initial top time guidance usually comes from the regulator bodies, global regional entities, et cetera, and they feed into the standard developing organizations. In the context of 5G, the initial requirement and the vision, which is the IMT new spectrum and vision, uh, driven by the ITU, the global organization, has actually started around the time of 2010. And then in the five years, the vision and the requirements have, uh, the 
initial vision has been laid out. And that is where most of the stakeholders are in this stakeholders have already started their research and prototyping and trials of the 5G research technology. And I would like to remind you, you might already know, the very first products of 5G were in the market around 2020, but the real products will be in the market into 2021. So we're talking about more than 10 years of, of a timeline from the kickoff of the vision uh, to uh, marketing the product. And after this five-year-old vision settlement, uh, then comes the concrete technical requirements identified, again, by these governing bodies, global um, organizations. And these are, this overlaps usually the standardization uh, phase. So under 3GPP, uh, different releases day by day work on creating the specification for that particular technology. Um, starting from 2016, 3GPP um, and part of IEEE as well have sat down, all, all of us, all representatives of, from various companies have sat and worked very closely in a very competitive environment and defined the releases of 5G technology and the 5G product, 5G final spec specification was amended by us completed in 2020, which went into the 5G products and then 5G deployed. So uh, hopefully that shows how the initial vision translates into uh, core R&D and the product development in the context of 5G. And in 4G, it was very similar. In 6G, I will show it's very similar. So Professor Godar mentioned about the SUPs. I just want to uh, bring out the numbers here uh, to support his view. These are the numbers from Etsy. Um, so there are two observations we could make. It's year one to year five, comparing 4G technologies, patent families and 5G patent families. Uh, these are not the same years, obviously. Uh, the 4G patent families correspond to where 4G was developed, it's 2006 to 2010. And 5G patent families correspond to three years when 5G technologies were created, that's 2017 to 2019. So um, as we see, uh, there is a tremendous difference, tremendous difference between the numbers of the declared SCP to Etsy between 4G technologies and 5G technologies. In 5G, I believe there were about 12,000 SCPs declared to Etsy, it's on Etsy website, whereas in 4G, that was less than 4,000 uh, SEP declarations. So what we see here is it is an exponentially booming area. Um, so I am not a legal expert. I can't share. I, I, it's my own personal view. Opinions are, are my own. Uh, but looking at the numbers, this is becoming an exponentially uh, contentious, uh, contentious and also um, a booming, booming industry. So it's actually very good for IP professionals. So how does this work? Uh, I mean, how does R&D and licensing come together? So from my perspective, this is nothing but um, a twin turbo machine. So I, I believe I forgot to mention that. So I meant research professional, I mean, the technical and the professional, and I lead teams. Uh, and obviously I interact with my R&D team more than any. However, the second most interaction I have is with the IQ professionals, with our legal experts sitting in the company. We have about 300 PhD researchers. I would think we got more than 50, I believe more than 50 IQ professionals. So in my daily job, most of my efforts also go to interacting with IT professionals, creating the patterns, strategy, portfolios, so on and so forth. Uh, and that actually describes how it works. So there is an R&D uh, engine, part of the engine, and there's licensing part of the engine. They drive each other and they feed into each other. So let's look into R&D engine where I belong to. Um, and, and let's take you to the kitchen of how R&D engine works. Uh, first of all, uh, most of the effort is obvious ideation. So you create an idea for the next generation technology. Uh, this is where most of the innovation comes and interaction with IP professionals, 
uh, completing or driving the uh, creating the IP portfolio, so on and so forth. And very critically, the ideation or your inventions creations go into the dissemination phase in the standards or pre-standards organizations, you trial the, your technology, you show the test base, et cetera. So there are various dissemination uh, platforms besides standards and pre-standards. Um, and that the main nature of this is a lot of generations, all generations actually are very, very collaborative yet also competitive environments. So collaboration is key in driving the technology forward. So through collaboration, you identify the problems or even have a better glimpse of what future will be. And that also feeds into your ideation. So there's a circular uh, circular uh, life cycle, how R&D is done. So in the technology licensing engine, um, which where IP professionals also come into play. Um, so standard bodies define the tech needs, as I mentioned previously and the needs addressed by existing and ongoing core R&D. And this is hand in hand with the IP. Um, and then uh, as, as technology creators solutions, we present our solutions to different working groups in the standards. And hopefully those standards are adopted in the specification. And these solutions go into the products of the manufacturers. And there comes the licensing part. So we, ask or we are granted for the effort that we create the technology through successful implementation of the technology in various standards or, or, or products. So this is also circular in circular nature. Um, the manufacturers also influence standards, what type of requirements they need in their future products. Uh, and this is the life cycle we observe. As I mentioned, this part in this part and also um, the need addressed by core r and and also the licensing IP professionals and, and are in the professionals work very, very tightly. So um, I kept mentioning about the standards, et cetera. Want to give a glimpse how it works in real life in standards. Uh, so this is a real standards meeting uh, of 5G. In 5G there in every generation, there are different categories, RAN1, Radio Access Network 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and in this meeting, um, it was one of the important meetings where some of the key 5G technologies were agreed. These are the company representatives, usually R&D or standards reps, and um, driving the or pushing the technology of each company in the, in the corresponding standard. Um, so I, with all this in hand, I would like to uh, very shortly uh, tell you this story, a real story. Uh, I believe most of you, you know that. And this story happened, uh, so I, I studied in Ankara, even though I don't sadly get to visit the city, which I love that often. Um, I, I believe it's about 15 kilometers to the university, uh, to, to Ankara University. It's in Bilkent University. Uh, by Professor Ardal Arikan in 5G. One of the arguably most destructive technologies was called polar goats. Um, and and the, the, the tag I, I thought is an almost success, a success story, obviously, but an almost success story for Turkey. So uh, Professor Arikan invented uh, the polar coat technology through, after 20 years of his research. Uh, and it was one of the breakthroughs in information theory uh, over the last six years. And information theory is the theory that governs the digital communications really. And with this breakthrough, it became a key technology in 5G standards. Uh, and what it does is it creates reliable control of 5G signals, no need to go into technical details. Um, just, but, but as a keyword, uh, this technology was created uh, by a Turkish, inventor, professor, and then uh, just having the time check. And, um, and then it became successfully adopted in 5G uh, standards. So there are a couple of questions to ask here. Um, first question, I'm raising it to recent graduates for, for some brain teaser or some food for thought. Uh, first of all, what does it take to develop such disruptive technology? 
uh, obviously besides a world leading scientific mind. Uh, he's an exceptional professor researcher, world renowned, et cetera. Uh, so I, I believe that R&D, as R&D professionals, we have some say in this and we have some thinking um, of, uh, as how to answer this question. But then comes the other question. So how does this invention find its way to 5G? So there is a, an invention in a university and it became, it will be in every technology we use in 5G. Um, and in the context of Turkey, where Ankara University is placed, and it can be in your respective countries. I, and I know that it's an international program. Uh, so where is, or where was the Turkish r and IT ecosystem in this journey? So that's the question to really ask. Um, and last but not least question, uh, in, the, in the context of the program and, and, and uh, the Turkish r and IT ecosystem, where would you like to see uh, this in 10 years from today and knowing that 6G is on the way? Uh, these are all questions, uh, in, in my opinion, very, they're all very necessary questions to ask in particular for professionals who are starting their uh, careers uh, very soon. Uh, I would like to just refer here, uh, there are also very good things happening in the country. I would like to just refer to TUSIAT, uh, an effort undertaken by TUSIAT. It's called Technology Standards and SAP Task Force. Uh, they are one-on-one -on -one addressing these questions. Um, and I would like, I, I would urge you to, to have a look at their website as well. Um, and another snapshot, that's the moment where the polar code technology was adopted in 5G. That's at 1.30 a.m. after 14 hours of fights and discussions and all. That's the moment it got accepted and found its place in 5G. So I'll be concluding in one or two minutes, uh, presented already 5G timeline. Now we are at the beginning of 6G technologies. Uh, and how does it look like? Most, if you will be working in telco area in your up in the upcoming ten years of professional life, you will probably be working on this. I'm, I wanted to lay out to you uh, the timeline in advance. Um, so, uh, similar to five G, the vision um, and everything are presented or have been discussed as we speak by ITU already. How six G should be? How should we see? technology 10 years from today. And we all are putting our inputs here, influencing it. So different um, stakeholders in the technology. And in around 25, the real technical requirements will be derived, will be available to us. And then 27, 28 uh, proposals in standards, 3GPP most likely. And then we'll come to specification. We will see the first 6G technology in our uh, lives around 2030. And obviously, all of us, all stakeholders have aggressively started creating technology uh, for 6G. And that is a hand in hand operation where we try to divide the vision. And at the same time, we create the technology and push it into different standards. So, and finally, I mentioned that um, 5G, the old numbers, old generations lay out good vision, but, but even generations usually solve a lot of problems. Uh, and the 6G vision on top of 6G is also very, very ambitious. Uh, I, I am fairly confident that we will get to see holographic type communication. So in 10 years, if we speak again, we will see each other in 3D format, not 2D. Um, and I am fairly confident that, conf confident that we will have haptic type communications where we will be able to control machinery uh, with, or with different ways as if it, they are extension of our mind or bodies. And we will get to crack the technology that will enable full autonomous technologies among many other things. So to conclude, uh, every technology generation is an output of a collective and very well structured ecosystem and a machinery. Uh, it's a competitive machinery, really. So there's innovation angle, IP protection, regulation, STOs, licensing and commercialization. Um, and the timelines that generate these technologies easily extend over a decade or more. So that's an important factor to really have some understanding of. Um, and IP knowledge and expertise is at the center of this ecosystem. And if I would like to give one piece of advice as an R&D professional, um, I would say 
a real solid comprehension and interrelation between these ecosystem elements, players, and the added dimension into this thinking of the timeline and the global dimension into it will be very, very critical for an IP professional. And I would also remind the case study I mentioned, it could be translated in the, core, in, in the respective countries, obviously not necessarily Turkey. Uh, so what, what are the reflections of this global IP ecosystem onto your country, onto Turkey? Um, and what would be the efficient ways as IP professionals to reach the end goal? Uh, but it's a bit oxymoron, it's a bit chicken and egg problem, obviously with the end goal being defined first. And I would like to conclude my presentation here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shahin. Uh, you gave us really a clear picture of uh, intersection between research and development and standardization processes in, in 5G, 3G, 4G, and 5G, uh, indeed. It was, uh, really, it was really engaging and interesting presentation. Uh, before, before opening the floor for the questions, uh, it was uh, also interesting to see the atmosphere in, in the working group, working groups. So, uh, for example, one, one picture was taken at 1.30, and it was something like uh, the decision of declaration of a standard pa essential patents, uh, maybe. So I, what, I, what I wonder is whether, uh, is this something very common or it was just peculiar to this moment? Uh, it becomes much more common as we get to the stage of specification agreement in a standard. In fact, that was the month where we had to agree on the specification of the 5G technology. And there are obviously some technologies which are more contentious, contentious than the other. This one also has more political angle because the polar code technology was actually brought to standard by Chinese companies. And the Western companies and American companies opposed to that. So they tried to clash, they tried to provide their technology. So there was a bit of political, geopolitical angle to those discussions so they became extremely heated uh, and i believe that we will get to see that geopolitical clashes much more uh, in in 6g uh, standard definitions thank you so what, what what is what is the backgrounds of the participants of these working group meetings are they ip professionals or uh, managers of the companies no, like this is this is mainly uh, we call them standard reps uh, they're mainly technical people Mm -hmm. um, because they push the technologies of the companies in the standards and the, the nature of the, the discussions are very technical. Uh, so they're technical, but they have really good experience and expertise in negotiations, presenting their ideas um, and, and uh, interacting with, with the stakeholders. Thank you. So we have around eight minutes for questions from sure. the participants. Uh, so the floor is already open. We have a question in the Q&A uh, part. I'll be reading it out from Hale Gezgin. Uh, Gezgin, sorry. She asks, how can the R&D companies that related to IoT and AI production and services can success on the IoT and AI-based standard essential patents or emerging patents? What kind of patent development team should be? Uh, yeah, uh, very, very valid question. Very good question. Um, the, the, uh, so I can only provide my perspective from an R&D uh, expert, R&D professional. Um, the way we approach this is that once you are the pioneer of a technology, um, and one you are, once you are in the position of driving a technology, um, you have a lot to say how that technology will be in the standard. So uh, the position I take, we would like to take and we try to take is really to be at the forefront of the technology creation um, so that our, we, are not the, we are not the followers, but we are the leaders in the technology. And I'm talking about not per se of the tech, of company I work for, that's true for every, every company, uh, so that the technology is de facto technology in the standard. So in, in the context of IoT and AI, um, the technology should be excellent, obviously, 
uh, that would increase the chances of your innovation invention to be an SCP and take place to be part of, of any standard. Thank you very much. And another question from, from Baris Sevan. Uh, Dr. Shahin, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very enlightening to hear about this issue from the point of view of an R&D professional. I'm wondering how uh, is the current environment in the telecommunication ecosystem about IP litigation from your view? How does the so-called patent wars affect your operations in an R&D company having witnessed the aggressive litigation strategies enforced by certain companies? Um, so I believe uh, we have much more uh, skilled people in the, in the uh, panel uh, to answer this question. Um, I would be the least uh, expert, uh, but from an R&D perspective, uh, it is really not impacting us much, all these litigations and all. So for us, it's business as usual. Um, it is really, really um, in the shop of the IP professionals and licensing professionals. But obviously, um, based on the litigations ongoing, so I, uh, the, the company I work for has quite a few of them, um, we get to understand the nature of the business better, how competitive it is. And that is an, an input to what we do in the sense of uh, whether our technology is in the right direction or not. So uh, in, in a way, if you're in a litigation, I would argue that we're, we might be doing something at least noticeable. Um, so uh, that's the level, I guess, but it's really not impacting our Indian professionals in daily basis. Yeah, so you, you are not an IP professional, but the, most of the participants in, in this uh, conference are uh, IP professionals. So from yes. that point, I, I would like to ask you, uh, so how is your relation and communication with IP pro professionals in your company? And I also want to ask, do you, do you have any, any messages or advices for, for our graduates, uh, particularly uh, mm -hmm. as, as being a manager of, of an IP-oriented company? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first part of your question, uh, as I mentioned, um, I da in daily basis interact with IP professionals. So because we create the technology, but they brand the technology. So we develop the product together. So from an R&D company perspective, there is a product. It's the R&D you do, but how you protect it and how you portray it, it, it is the product. So that we really do together. Uh, and it's my daily job. If I have, let's say, 20 meetings in a week, 10 of them are with IP professionals. So how do I interact with them? We have the invention, nerd invention <laughs> in a way, and we present this to IP professionals and I'm always, always so really like, it's amazing how they take the technology and put it into IP context. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, so, uh, it's really hand-in-hand -hand operation. So the other part of your question is um, the, the advice to IP professionals. The biggest advice I would give is that there are multiple perspectives in this huge business. So there's IP perspective, there's R&D perspective, there's regulatory, et cetera. It is always excellent. It's always great. And it helps a lot to really keep the other perspective in, perspectives in place as well, from R&D pers angle or regulatory angle, or even commercial financial uh, business perspectives. Um, the other thing I would like to say, always good to keep the timeline in mind. So we're talking, it's not a product that you produce in a month and put into market next month. This, a product goes into market in 10 years time. So always have that in your mind as well when you think about innovation, IP creation, licensing, et cetera. And the other advice, component to my advice would be, this is a very geopolitical business. And those players also come into the place too. Very complex, but uh, I would argue a student who successfully completes an IP or the excellent panelist, uh, you have the sophistication level to comprehend the complexities of this environment. So don't shy away to look at, at other factors and have this global view. So that would be my 
advice to fresh thank, graduates. Thank you very much for the advice. So let's move on to the next question uh, from a colleague, I think from WIQ. Really great presentation. May I kindly have the email of Dr. Shahin? I work at WIP and we are organizing sometimes some sessions, which we invite some external speakers. If Dr. Shine is interested, I can propose his candidature for a future presentation, maybe the beginning of next year. So this is a yeah. kind of invitation. Thank you so much. I yeah. appreciate mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. I would be, I would be uh, privileged to attend it. Absolutely. Thank you. And the next one uh, from Chevron Hassan Ahmed. Thanks for your nice presentation. As lawyers, we are dealing with paper mostly. Do you think the new generation will be all electronic and no more papers? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. I also really dislike this paper thing. I, I suffered a lot, but thankfully over the last year, we moved to all electronic interaction with our legal expertise and that really, really um, gave me a breather room. So yes, the answer is yes to that. Happily, yes, yes. Thank you very much. It seems we ended up the questions. Um, I will have one more final question. Uh, indeed, you you raised uh, you raised some you raised some critical questions in your presentation already. But what I would like to ask, if uh, Turkey or like in general developing countries uh, have a role to play in maybe not in 5G but in 6G, uh, what do you think about that? What's your view? Uh, so it's not only R&D, quality of the R&D professionals, it's the quality and uh, quantity of IP professionals as well. So I'm very, very glad this program is happening in Turkey and other developing countries. It's uh, an absolutely necessary uh, element to that. Uh, but they need to, each, it's an ecosystem, Mr. Bashmanar. This is an ecosystem that needs to develop together. Turkey's excellent engineers, excellent R&D facilities, companies and all. It was always lacking the IP professionals in this context. I know there are IP, IP lawyers, I know, but I'm talking about a more in-depth expertise in a specific technology, let's say telecommunications. They need to come together, understand the complicated complexions of the business, which I know they will comprehend and then start developing this 10 year, 20 year time plans. Uh, I, I am not at a place to argue this should be government driven or, or, or private sector, uh, but there are means to that. But uh, it's very clear what the players of this ecosystem are. And it's also clear that all of them should come to a level to start making impact in a global stage. And the strategies, et cetera, can be discussed. Tushyat is doing an excellent job in that regard. Uh, but, but what was essential is this IP program, and I, I would like to thank you uh, and everyone uh, for, for uh, carrying on this program. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, as you already mentioned, what Tushyat right now has been doing is really critical and important for, for Turkey as well. And last question uh, from Barkın Soğuksulu. Uh, I'll read it out. We know that some countries, especially China, have really ambitious goals about international standardization. Uh, for example, China standards 2035 plan and have established a strong organization that includes all critical shareholders like the government, academy, and private sector. And we know that from telecommunication perspective, previous generation ECPs affect the following ECPs and standards. So if a few shareholders will be the holder of most of the patents, will this be an obstacle for agile innovation activities and become a monopoly in the future? Uh, this is a very ex excellent point, I think. Uh, it's excellent observation as well. This is what we have been seeing all the time. The stakeholders usually shy away from very disruptive technologies in the upcoming generations. Uh, so you know the European stakeholders, American stakeholders as well. The newcomers should need to really break some ground and provide disruptive technologies. That's the clash. The Polar Codes example is a fantastic um, uh, situation, uh, uh, uh, case study, because the incumbent big technologies wanted to keep the SCPs of the previous generation, and China said, no, there is this fantastic Polar Code technology performs much better, why don't we use that? So we saw that clash. And the answer is, yes, it might create some monopoly, 
but yes, China is pushing really hard to be a, a to have a say in the upcoming 6G technology. Um, and that's a, that's a continuing battle really. But excellent point and it's true. Okay, from, from this answer, we reached to the end of this uh, session. So we really had very interesting uh, interventions, contributions from the participants. So I'd like to thank all the participants for their, for their questions and contributions. Uh, and, and participants also are thanking you for, uh, for your presentation. So Mr. Onushain, Dr. Onushain, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for answering the question. It was really a pleasure for me to share this uh, session with you. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be part of the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll be leaving the floor to Marta for, for the third, third uh, session. Marta, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I need to thank the partners, Tech Patent and Ankara University for the excellent collaboration in the delivery of the joint master's program. My gratitude also goes to the dedicated professors uh, who taught within the LLM program. I was so happy to notice that we've got also Professor Duncan Matthews and Professor Enrico Bonadio who are teaching in WIPO joint master's programs. Thank you very much for supporting us during this conference. And many thanks to our alumni who make us always proud and our 2020-21 uh, graduates. I was so thrilled when I heard that you had excelled regardless of the challenges of COVID-19. Congratulations. So turning to the conference, first of all, my special appreciation to Professor Goda and, Prof and uh, Dr. Sahin, your excellent presentations were very enlightening and you could see from the many questions from the participants. I will not repeat anything on what you have said, but I need straight away to go to the next topic, which is the last topic, which is titled Decompiling Standard Essential Patterns, Perspectives and Viewpoints in the Age of Internet of Things and Beyond. I have the great pleasure and honor to work with Ms. Tomoko Miyamoto. She is the head of the Patents and Treaties Law Section Patent and Technology Law Division in the World Intellectual Property Organization. Ms. Miyamoto joined the World Intellectual Property Organization in 1997, and he has worked on various issues regarding intellectual property. She has wide range experience with respect to patent policy, law and practices, including normative development of the international patent system, promotion of patent related treaties, legislative and legal advice to member states, these are WIPO member states, and provision of trainings in the area of patents. And some of the areas of her responsibility, she covers trade secrets protection. Prior to joining the World Intellectual Property Organization, Ms. Miyamoto worked for the Japan Patent Office. She holds a master's degree in electronics engineering and a master of laws in intellectual property and management. So I, with all these few words, I give the floor to Ms. Tomoko Miyamoto uh, to give us a, a presentation on this. Then we can, as usual, please do send your questions to Q&A so that we can look at them later. I don't know if, if Ms. Miyamoto's PowerPoint presentation could be uh, put up so that we can start the our last presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see your screen, but you, you, you, you are not. You can speak louder, or maybe the, um, right. the microphone. Hear, exactly. Now it's fine. Do you hear me now? All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation to speak at this IP conference that uh, targets on a very, very 
interesting and timely question, the SEP and the uh, Internet of the Things. Uh, the previous speaker, Dr. Sahin, also mentions about the importance of having a different perspective in this, uh, in this area. So it, it runs kind of nicely to, to my presentation, where I also would like to talk a little bit about the different perspectives and viewpoints in the age of IoT and uh, well, 5G and maybe even beyond. Uh, so my presentation is structured in a way that uh, I would like to first uh, provide a little bit of background and uh, high level questions relating to this particular topic and briefly talk about WIPO's activities relating to the patents and technical standards. It is not too much, but still we have had conducted a couple of uh, activities in this area. So I would like to talk a little bit about it. And then uh, more specifically, uh, let me look into this era of Internet of Things, IoT. Uh, the, some of the issues were already um, raised by the previous speakers. But I also would like to highlight a couple of new challenges in this new environment and then the perspective of stakeholders involved in, in, this, uh, in this field. And then finally, just to wrap up my presentation and move on to the question and answer session. So um, I have been involved in the discussions on the patent and standard, probably something around 2007, 2008. Uh, in particular, in the context of the ITU um, IP policy, the development of the IP policy in the ITU. Um, definitely, I'm not a part of the standard setting in the ITU. I'm not the, no, I don't have that uh, technical background. Uh, but still, just uh, I was contributing more on the IP side of the um of the policy ip policy of the standard setting organizations and at that time there were quite some discussions about the contentions between patent system and standard system and the the important things to note is that in fact the patent system and the standard system has a lot of commonalities they both aims at encouraging investment innovation. They both encourage uh, disclosure of the technological information. Uh, they also aim at the dissemination of the technology at a wider scale, and then the, to facilitate or to promote consumers to enrich their life. And the, finally, the, and I think this is a very important thing, these patent system, the standard system, they are they function hand in hand with competition law or antitrust to have um, to try to strike a right balance between the holder of the patents or the holder of the SEP or whatever it could be to, to balance the the interest of the different stakeholders involved in these systems. So the SEP, the Standard Essential Patents. Um, definitely, as a wrapping up, the, it is the interest of all of us that the standard once adopted is widely implemented uh, by, the, by those who are interested in using the st standard technology. And, but at the same time, it is the, um, I think it is an, it's a legitimate interest for those technology holders who have invested in these technologies and having a patent to have the possibility to um, recover their investments. Um, and then also the, it is um, widely accepted or the everybody's interest that there is a competition and there will be a more choices for consumers. 
the patents in the standards, I'm sure I have not researched on this, but I'm sure that it has been in standards for, I don't know, for so many years. But I think the discussion of the standard essential patent SEPs that has been uh, given the more prominence with the standardization of the ICT technology, information and communication technology. Why? Because I think it is the interoperability is the key to this technology. And it's not just the interoperability in the domestic world within the country, but we need to, the, the necessity is that we, we need to be connected internationally. Um, so the, in, somehow the importance, uh, geographical dimensions that was also discussed by the previous speaker, this is becoming much more prominent aspect uh, in, in this topic. The another issue is that ICT technology this is a complex technology and it tends to have more patents and then more multiple owners. So the patent landscape can become a little bit more um, complicated. Um, there are a number of mechanisms in the patent system try to balance the different interests of the stakeholders. There is certainly a mechanism in the standardization process try to balance it. And also the mechanism in the antitrust or the competition frameworks as well. Um, the, so the technical standards are obviously set up by the standard setting organizations and they do have IPR policies uh, nowadays. Uh, they are well established that the standard setting organizations, each of them have APR policy. They are not the same. Each organization have slightly different policy uh, depending on the type of the standard they're setting. The, it's it's uh, depending on the how the people who are participating in this particular standard setting uh, can agree on. So it's a kind of a self-regulation in a way uh, to provide the uh, rules in the, within the standard setting process. Um, I think the many of the issues were already mentioned by, I think, particularly by Professor Godal, uh, how these uh, standard setting bodies work. The one of the, let's say, issues that has to be highlighted maybe is that there is, while the technology holders, they declare the patents or patent applications, which may be essential for the implementation of the standard, there is no validity of those uh, patents are not checked inside the standard setting organizations. The, whether the declared patents are really essential to the patents or not, this is not checked inside the standard setting organization. Um, there is no kind of, you know, are you ready to license this technology with 2.5% uh, licensing, a royalty rate, or those, those kind of licensing discussions would not take place uh, inside the standard setting organizations. The, um, there are different reasons why those things were not taking place in the standard setting organization. There could be an issue of the cost, there could be an issue of the practicality, but particularly on this last point of no licensing discussions inside the standard setting organization, this is because of the competition issues, because such kind of horizontal negotiation could be considered as a violation of the antitrust or competition law. So there are 
Many things can be done by the IPR policy, but certain things might, it, it cannot be probably the solution for everything. Um, now, the, the IP policies of the most of the SSOs, they refer to the commitment of the technology providers to the friend licensing. And this is generally considered as ensuring the comparability with the competition law. Um, and certainly, the, there are a lot of questions relating to this friend licensing. And many questions have been at least clarified or partly clarified through the improvement of the standard setting organizations IPR policy or through the court decisions um, in different parts of the world. Um, however, the situation today, I think there are still a lots of lots of questions which are not answered. For starting from a very big question, what is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, license? How to calculate brand royalty? Or yes, the parties, they declare the essential patents, um, but are these patents the, the issue is not, okay, here is a patent, a published patent, or here's a published patent application. The issue is whether they are really valid or not. And how can I check that? Uh, is the pat declared patent really essential? Um, who has the, who had to check them? Who bears the cost? Um, the courts, so if you go to the court, it's very expensive and might not everybody might not be able to afford it. Uh, is there any other way to this settle the dispute? Um, generally, I think the global license, uh, meaning that the one license that allows a licensee to use the patented technology globally, uh, with a certain conditions and royalty rate. This is, as such, I think is not considered as uh, against the competition law as such. Um, however, how does it work uh, in practice? How could, uh, how could it be enforced? So, um, and one of the things which is striking, uh, at least uh, it, which strikes me more and more is the, on the one side, the international standards are getting very, very important. Um, this is because of the global technology procurement and, uh, of course, global market, which leads to the uh, many stakeholders involved in the different part of the world. And once it is the standard is set, it affects much a broader um, geographical area than before. And at the same time, the IP right, this is a territorial right. So the grant of the patents and the enforcement of patents, they are carried out at the national level. And I would not say it's a gap, but still there is something that we need to think, or there is a particular issues that comes out from this angle of the international dimension, as well as uh, on the one hand and the rights at the national 
um, the, and the ration, national rights. So let me just step out a little bit and talk about WIPO's activities. So the um, there are a couple of activities that also involved WIPO member states. And sometime around 2009 to 2010, uh, there was some discussions on the patents and standards as the Standing Committee on the Law of Patents. This is the WIPO's member states committee discussing on the various issues on patents. The topic, the, there were general discussions on these issues, but it did not, the topic itself did not stay in the agenda of the committee. So after 2010, it was taken out from the committee's agenda. Um, well, after some time, uh, we organized the information session on patents and standards. It's an ad hoc, um, well, kind of ad hoc seminar. And there, uh, a study on technical and practical aspects relating to patent quality in the context of a standard essential patents, which was actually uh, produced by an external expert, was presented in this session. Um, around that time, one of the issues or topics of the SCP, which is continued to be a topic of the SCP, is the quality of patent. So this study uh, put some light on the patent quality uh, in the context of the SEPs. So the issues are more related to the, the contribution of the IP offices to the SEP discussions. Uh, for example, like um, standard draft, which are discussed in the standard setting organizations, depending on, on how those discussions are, are conducted, they could be considered as a, um, as a prior art under the patent law. So if they are considered as a prior art, that could and maybe that should be used for the determination of the patentability. The issue, and then you know, how, how could the patent office get those information? How could they put it in a searchable way and really use it? Um, another issue is the, in the standard setting organization, uh, they have those um, SEP databases uh, which is useful, but if it is not updated, um, then it, and people are just left out, whether is this patent still valid or it's not valid, is the owner changed, um, then that might not give the full picture to the people concerned. So the one idea was to how we can link the standard setting organizations database with a patent registry, which is regularly updated and providing the uh, legal status of the relevant patent. Uh, there are some also other um, studies prepared, for example, in the area of patent pool. Uh, and the last one I think was prepared by the secretary for as a background paper. Um, but maybe as a most, let's say, practical contribution to this SEP uh, area from WIPO side is the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center, which provides the arbitration and mediation service uh, for uh, private parties. And in this particular SEP context, uh, there is, um, here is a website. We have a dedicated website uh, on the ADR procedures for the resolution of separated disputes. And we provide, for example, like a model form uh, for the requesting arbitration mediation specifically uh, designed uh, for the SEP or FRAN related um, alternative dispute resolution. And some guidance is uh, given uh, 
on on this um, on this air in this area. Now, things. Um, the importance of the IoT. This is already highlighted. And according to one of those uh, consulting companies report, uh, 4G IoT, the interoperability required to capture the 40% of the total value of the IoT. So the interoperability, this is really a key for capturing value from the Internet of Things. And then another, um, number that I find very interesting is it says that uh, the IoT creates values, of course, in developed countries, and they calculate it like 60%, but also in developing countries, which is they calculated 40%. So to me, the it is a significant number that and the IoT can really become uh, technology which does not necessarily just um, gives benefit to developed countries, but also to developing country and gives benefit uh, at the global level. Now, um, so how could that looks like then? Now, Clearly, the IoT means there are more and more new stakeholders outside the ICT entering into the market. We have heard about Internet of well, Internet of Things, but Internet of Health, Internet of um, Energy, Internet of uh, Connected Cities. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. So there will be definitely more and more business being involved. And that means probably there will be more and more collaboration between these stakeholders uh, getting necessary. On the standardization side, it probably means more and more different kind of a standard setting body could be involved in uh, and the IoT. Um, so this is just to show there are so many standard setting organizations, which could be either across the board or in a certain specific areas that might be uh, involved in the standard setting. Now, so what does this mean? Uh, probably when we're talking about SIP licensing, there will be a more complex licensing landscape, obviously. And these um, potential SIP licensors and potential licensees they might be coming from the different business sector, which might have the different kind of IP culture or a different kind of IP licensing practices. So there could be a kind of cultural crash between the different business sectors. We have seen that, well, we can imagine that if these licensing negotiations were done by the chip, only between the chip manufacturers, they know the technology, there is established business practice. So there is, of course, but they still have some common ground. We have seen some kind of cultural crash when the computer industry like Microsoft, Apple, they enter into the more like uh, the computers becoming connected uh, to the outside world through Wi-Fi or whatever. And then the certainly I see technologies are integrated into the laptop and there is some um, kind of crash between the two. Now, then there is a smartphone, 
which basically integrate to the traditional telephone and uh, the what they which in, integrate computer into the traditional telephone and camera and, and everything. And then again, here is a crash between the traditional, let's say, telephone uh, companies and smartphone manufacturers. And now what we're seeing is the, of the from the side of the connected cars in particular, there is a lot of dispute between the ICT industry and the automotive industry. And who knows in the future. These, so far, when I look at it, these, of course, these um, court cases, they could be also highlight, they could be just highlighting the uh, piece of the iceberg, which means that the big players in the market, but there are these smartphone, computer, automotive, they seems to be a relatively concentrated uh, industry. And the global licensing strategies that could be convenient for both licensor and licensee. Uh, when this connective world be goes to everything, does it still work? There may be a local implementation of the standard for local products and local services. Um, how could all these different licensing players and the potential licensor work together? Um, I'm putting a lot of questions, but at the same time, I don't want it to be like a scaremonger. And we have to just take a breath and uh, we need to stay calm. So the, of course, the SEP is a very strong patent, but that is not the, and of course the SEP is very important or even essential for the implementation of the standard. But there are also in other technical fields where the value of the patent is very, very high. So I think we should not uh, lose sight uh, on the, on the on the entire patent system, I think that was also the one point of the Professor Godal's point. Uh, the patent is technology neutral, and then I think we do need to uh, see the things in a broad, holistic manner. Um, I was looking a little, in order to prepare for this presentation, I was looking a little bit and reading certain things. And the, it's, there is the, I'm just trying to quote from something. Uh, um, I was listening to, I was reading this um, business review letter uh, relating to the IEEE's um, IP policy issued by the United States um, DOJ Department of Justice, which is a competition authority of the US. And well, they initially issued this business review letter in 2015. And then they recently kind of issued another letter as a second letter or updated letter in September 2000. So there is a five years gap and it's kind of striking to see that how the entire ecosystem, if you can, if you want to say so, the ecosystem has changed and how the same competition authorities uh, look at the things in, well, they probably they were not, they were not looking at things in a different way, probably they're looking at the same way, but the, change in the ecosystem has brought them 
to say something different from what they had said in 2015. And in this 2000, the review letter in year 2000, the DOJ was kind of cautioning about using antitrust to remedy what is essentially a contractual dispute. Um, so here, again, this is a question, but it is the, how, where exactly is the problem? It is the question of essentially a contractual dispute or it is the something that requires more the government interventions or government regulations or, or any sort of more, it is more like a framework question. I think that is um, a valid question to ask um, to ourselves. Now, so with that, um, the clearly there is, as the DOJ said, clearly there is this um, aspect of the private companies contractual dispute of private companies business dispute elements. And from the SEP owners perspective, they had invested to their technology, they had contributed to the technology. So uh, in for the standardization, with the expectation that they could uh, get a fair return on their investment. And they would clearly try to set up a strategy uh, for to get the maximum output from the efforts they have made. On the other hand, there are implementers of the standard who wanted to use the not. Uh, they are probably they know that nothing is free. So um, they are willing to be a part of the ecosystem, I believe. But still, they are also concerned about what can be the cost of, of my product. If I have to pay, how can that be ended up to the cost of my product? And how could I sort of negotiate uh, this brand license with the SEP licensor? That will be the inventor, uh, implementers um, kind of legitimate um, perspective. Then, of course, there are consumers perspective who wanted to benefit from the end products and who wanted to be connected um, with all over the world, who wanted to have the wide choice of product, who needs a security. And then um, more recently, I think many people are concerned about the privacy as well in the digital environment. So all this could come to the consumer's um, viewpoint. And I didn't make uh, any slide on this, but probably from the policy, there could be another perspective, which are the policy makers. And probably the policy makers perspective is how we can find a right balance between among the interest of these different players. And um, with the IoT, uh, probably a larger number of market players in nearly every economic sector uh, would require the connectivity and the standards relating to this area becomes probably getting more and more important. Um, at the same time, so that means these unanswered questions, they could affect more stakeholders. Um, who 
could be in a different part of the world, uh, who could be under the different jurisdictions, and who could be um, in the different industry sector. The, I don't think the solutions is in one part of our ecosystem. Um, the solution could be in the standardization process. It could be in the functioning of the patent system. Uh, we had talked a little bit about the contribution of the patent office. Uh, the solution could be in the application of the competition laws or, and probably most likely the com in the combination of the any of those things. And, or even outside this, the solution could be just the self-regulations, business practices among the market players. Um, in any event, the, for the parties to make an informed decision, uh, they need to have the information, factual information. And if the IoT is going to increase the type of participants to this, um, to this area, including the small and medium enterprises and so on, then um, in my view, it is probably more important to have this very sound uh, information about how the system work, uh, what they can offer, what they cannot offer, so that the, each players can decide what kind of actions, uh, what kind of options they have, and what kind of auction actions they can take. Um, with this, I. I'm going to stop my presentation and thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to answer to any question. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Miyamoto. That was excellent, very clear. And the strategy that you are also using uh, to ask questions, you know, even for you, you are answering them and you are giving also hints and tips on our uh, participants to find means and ways of getting the answers and where there are some complications, I really could see the increase the complicity uh, of the standards. There's one question here from, uh, from Dr. Enrico Bonadio. There's another question later, uh, who was asking about one of your slides uh, on SDO. Uh, and you wanted to know, he was wondering if they are all governmental bodies or not. Yes. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for the question. No, no, no, they are not all the governmental body. Maybe yes. I could mm -hmm. sure. uh, go back. It has to go back. Uh, where was it? Uh, yeah, here it is. Um, yes. I, on the first line, uh, maybe this could give you some ideas. The ITU, uh, International Telecommunication Union, um, incidentally, they are standing in front of WIPO's building, so we are neighbors. Uh, they are the um, UN, a special agency of the United Nations, like WIPO, and they do have the function of uh, creating the telecom um, standardized. So this is a UN organization. ETSI, this is a European uh, standard setting um, organization, and I don't want to say something wrong, <laughs> but the, it's, it's, it is kind of semi-official um, organization. It is not under the European Union, if I understand correctly, and probably maybe Professor Duncan can help me to clarify this, um, but it is sort of part of the European, uh, official European it's a system that um, that regulates the the European uh, that establishes a European standard in the telecom sector. Uh, ISO International Standard 
standard organ standardization organization. ISO is, um, they do have the government participants or the and the industry participants in their constituency, but it is not the intergovernmental organization uh, as such, because it is not like uh, uh, government or the member states of the organization is and having the, let's say, the sole power to decide on the things. So in that aspect, it is not the intergovernment organization, but governments are also participating in the ISO activities. I, I e, IEEE and 3GPP, this is more of the consortium, industry consortium, where these uh, industries who have technologies, they come up together and then set up the standard, standards. I hope it helps. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bonadio. Do you have a follow-up question on that one? Yes, if if I may, can you hear me? Yes, yes I do. Okay. No, thanks for this really interesting, clear presentation. I I am interested in the interface between um, SEPs and uh, antitrust uh, competition law. You have uh, mentioned that uh, several times. Do you think, especially looking at Europe, the EU, do you think that uh, competition law responses to patent ambush techniques by uh, SEP holders, old up strategies, uh, do you think that these competition law responses uh, are fair or they do go too far? For example, considering uh, uh, enforcing injunction against the implementers in certain circumstances as an abuse of dominant position, as in the UIA case in 2015, a court of justice? Or do you think that the refusal to license uh, on front terms uh, might be considered a, an abuse of dominant position? That was the case in, uh, da in Daimler versus Nokia we know that they have settled now. So I don't know if uh, the EU case, the, the Court of Justice case will go ahead. But I mean, EU, EU institutions, the Commission, the Court of Justice, I mean, they're being quite strict. Do you think this is the right approach? Yes, um, I, you know, I, I really feel like I cannot say like, uh, yes, uh, answer to your question in the yes and no type of answer. The, of course, the each case, as, as you, you well know, that each case had, are decided on its merit, uh, case by case, under the specific circumstance of the each case. But it's, um, I think, uh, like, like any other uh, court cases, we could not make just to look at one case and make a doctrine uh, that applies to everything out of it. So that, and the, what I, what I wanted to, what I can say is the, I'm, I'm particularly looking in the thinking about the US policy uh, on the competition side. There were time where the US competition authorities were relatively strict to the SEP holders, well, in, in my view, and the, the, and that was a time where the patent hold up by the SEP holders or the patent thickets are sort of buzzwords and the or patent trolls, these are the buzzwords uh, in the in, in the in this in this environment or in the, in that world. The um, there are but when the time goes by, there are also the recognition that it is not only patent hold up, but it is there is also patent hold out from the 
implementers side, and that could be um, quite a problem. Um, so there, and also there are some concerns that if we go too far and to push the patent holders, they would not be interested in contributing to the standard any standard setting anymore. They would rather stay away from it. So there were some concerns about going too far. As, and I think that is where your question is, is coming as well. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned in this, uh, the updated uh, business letter from the DOJ, the Department of Justice, relating to the IP policies of the IEEE, they do seem to have a clear swing in a way to another direction. And I think another example of this is uh, and there is a joint statement by the Department of Justice, USPTO, and the National Institute of Standard and Technology, um, NIST. And in 2000, I think there was in 2013, there was uh, one joint statement relating to the injunctive relief, uh, which goes, which was a relatively a strict way of, of seeing the things. But that is also a kind of um, shifted a little bit in the new joint statement, which was, um, I don't remember exactly, but 2019, relatively recently, there was another joint statement among these uh, three institutions. So the, the, there is always a kind of shift uh, between or somewhere in between the extreme, the one extreme side and another extreme side. And probably this is very healthy in a way to have this uh, sort of adapting to the adapting to the new stakeholders, adapting to the new technology, adapting to the to the new environment. Um, adapting to the new strategies that are invented by very clever lawyers. Um, this, is, um, this is kind of healthy. And I'm, I'm sure that is why even in Europe, there's a lot of policy discussion going on, how they could best adapt to this changing uh, environment. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not really fully answering no, to your question. No, no, I, I, <laughs> thank you. I think we need to find a balance and uh, I, I, I, I, I, I totally agree on that. It's, it's not so easy to find it sometimes, but yeah, we need to find the balance between the implementers and the SEP holders' interests. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Good. Thank you very much. I think uh, Ms. Tomoko has already answered. That's the question which you put in the chat, right? Then uh, there was there's a good comment from uh, Professor Duncan Matthews that Ms. Miyamoto is correct. ETSI is not an EU institution. It is an association registered under French law and receives funding from various sources, including the EU. So that one answers the question which you had already responded uh, to Professor Bonadio. Now, there's another question now. Here is your question. Thank you for your enlightening presentation. You mentioned the competition angle. I would like to hear your views on the protection of personal data as well, as there appears an intersection with the extended use of IOTs, Internet of Things, with regard to intellectual property protection and privacy by design. And the last comment is said, wish you all the best. <laughs> we is wishing all the best to the graduates, the LLM graduates in this program. So and is the question okay with you, Ms. Miyamoto? Thank you very much. I give you the floor. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I'm afraid I, am, I, I won't be able to fully answer to your question, but I can say is uh, recently we had uh, some discussion with one of, the, um, one of the technology companies who are also involved in the 5G, 6G research. And they were saying that in their research, this aspect of the protection of personal data, that is very, very important in, uh, in their development of that technology. So it is uh, not just a question of the law, uh, but all these technology, those who are developing the technology, they are fully aware of it. And uh, it is part of the, um, let's say, uh, technology development. Uh, that was the sense I got. Um, and I, I also would like to join the, all the best wishes to the graduates of, uh, of, these, of this program as well. Good. Thank you very much. Um, I think I think uh, Professor Boda is left, right? Okay. I wanted to check if uh, anybody wants to make a comment. Maybe I can ask also, you know, Miss Miyamoto, you if you have got something to close, then we can ask also Dr. Sayin, you are there. Excellent. You can do a closing. You can do some closing remarks uh, after Miss Miyamoto's uh, closing remarks. Then, uh, if Professor Gonda is back, then we can ask Professor Gonda. Then we give the floor back to Ankara University. So, Miss Miyamoto, if you need to say something to close your presentation, we are right on time. <laughs> well, thank you, Malta, for the for again to me. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here. And um, also I was listening to Mr. Godal's presentations and the Dr. Sahin's uh, presentation as well. And thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I was, um, I, I also learned, I also learned a lot and particularly, I, I really liked Dr. Sahin's presentation, <laughs> which really shows the real world, uh, people working in the technology and uh, working in this development of the technology. And, and I, I found it really fascinating um, and how you interact and how you work together with the IP community is very much enlightening. Um, I also like to thank the Ankala University and also maybe the co-organizers of this master program and this IP conference for putting the excellent uh, program together and particularly uh, to choose this uh, topic of the SEP and uh, uh, I IoT, which um, I also mentioned it here, but it, it's really the area that has a lot of questions, very interesting but important uh, questions. And uh, we do think, um, well, WIPO is a little bit, uh, we, we call ourselves a member state driven organization as Marta knows well. <laughs> so in a way we're driven by the member states, but clearly if the member states or the Turkish patent office, any of the IP offices uh, would, um, as would um, you know, come up with their proposal that the white post should look into these areas. Of course, uh, we're happy to uh, work together with our uh, member states on this issue as well. So with this, I close um, my last remark and I really wish all of you, particularly the graduates uh, for the best wishes and your great future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miyamoto. So now I give the floor to Dr. Sayin. After Dr. Sayin, we ask a tech patent to say some few words before we give back the 
explore to uh, Ankara University. So Dr. Sain, thank you very thank you, much. Thank you very much. I will also extend my gratitude to Ms. Miyamoto. It was an excellent presentation. I learned a lot and I will go back to the slides and <laughs> check them again. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I think IP professionals and new graduates will find themselves in an extremely exciting era. Uh, it will be much more exciting than last 10, 20 years. And there's a reason for that because technology is an exponentially growth era now. Uh, yes, we have come a long way, but now we are talking about holographic communications to driverless cars and also it will be notion driven and IP professionals will really set the rules. So I am very happy for that. Uh, it will be challenging. It will be a very competitive environment, but it will be very nurturing for them, uh, professionally and personally. Uh, just, I, I'll repeat, I don't want to say advice, but from my experience working with IP professionals over many years, um, we, we usually, when we collaborate with other fields, we tend to abstract what others do. So, for instance, at the beginning of my career, the patent application was an abstract. So the innovation I was doing was the material. Uh, but from what I've noticed is that from IP professionals perspective, research is abstract, but patent application is material. It's really not the case. So um, once you get together, not overly abstract, we have to abstract up to a point, of course, otherwise there, we wouldn't be specialists in our areas. But the real, real, innovation and bringing to market and impact happens when we kind of blur that boundary a bit, of course, being cognizant of these things. Um, and that needs, I think, a perspective from different angles. So I would urge the new graduates, try to have a couple of hats. Um, it's, it's really being engaged with the industry. It's what's happening geopolitically uh, in the world and try to bring them together because they will influence the world very much in the upcoming 10 to 20 years. And I wish you all the best, best of luck and hope to again, hope our roads will cross at one point, which I wouldn't be very surprised. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Sahin. You will not be surprised to receive another invitation from Waipo soon. And that was very you know, enlightening. And uh, we like young, vibrant, <laughs> and, you know, professors, doctors to, to, to work with us in order to assist our, our graduate students. Thank you very much. So I give the floor to Tech Patent. Um, thank you, Marta. Uh, it was also uh, our pleasure to listen to this uh, wonderful um, seminar webinar uh, from the best uh, speakers, from one of the best speakers in the world from this different perspectives. I was also uh, thrilled to see Mr. Heinz Godard. Uh, I was back to my student days. He's my professor from my LLM studies. So it's, it, it's a nice moment for me as well. Uh, thanks for all the organizers, all the contributors and all the participants. They did uh, excellent comments. I really learned a lot today, both from the pre presentations, but also from the uh, questions as well. And um, the last word goes to the students, the new graduates. Uh, they did fantastic uh, work this year. Uh, they were uh, very enthusiastic, even uh, virtually we had all the lectures uh, in a very uh, lively way. Um, and I hope uh, we will meet them soon, uh, either virtually or better physically uh, in IP environment. Thank you and all the best to all. Thank you very much, uh, Tech Patent. <laughs> we, are, we are truly honored and grateful to work with Tech Patent because we collaborate you know, very well, including Ankara University. Now the floor is to Ankara University. Thank you very much and invite you all. Yes, before we conclude the conference, may I kindly uh, ask all the panelists to, to turn on their cameras so Maybe we can take a picture as a souvenir of this batch. Yes, I, I'd like to express our gratitude to WIPO, to Turk Patent, as well as all the program collaborators, program contributors, faculty of our LLM program, 
and of course today's uh, speakers, uh, Professor uh, Nesde Dunoir, Professor Hassan, and Mr. Bradley, as well as our uh, moderators and uh, panelists today, uh, Dr. Onur Shain, Professor uh, Heinz Godar, uh, Ms. Tomoko Miyamako, Miyamoto, and uh, Mr. Jamal Vashpanar, uh, Professor Arz Oz, and, and to Marta, of course. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we, we express our uh, congratulations to our students for their great accomplishment uh, this year. And finally, of course, to our lecturers uh, in the presence of uh, Dr. Bonadio uh, here. Uh, and with this, yes, I, I would like to conclude uh, and close today's IP conference. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.